Sports Talk Daily with Andrew Hustler Patterson and Michael Remus. What's up, gang? Let's do this. Wednesday show, and we got a big one today on Winnipeg Sports Talk. Great to have you all with us. Andrew Patterson, Michael Remus. And uh, as I mentioned, we are loaded today. Jets, prospects on the ice today in official skate for the first time as rookie camp's underway. And then it is off to Penticton for the Young Stars competition. Spent quite a bit of time yesterday talking about it. Got some great feedback on the show in the YouTube comments as well. Thanks to everyone that dropped those in for our Why Not Question of the Day. Got another Jets-related Why Not Question of the Day coming up in just a few minutes. But um, this is going to be a lot of fun. Jamie Thomas will pop on first, probably from the Iceplex, I'd imagine, where... The prospects are getting things underway before the trip to Penticton. And uh, Jamie, obviously, uh, as part of the Winnipeg Jets broadcast team, will be out in BC all weekend long. We'll find out more about how we can watch the games, follow along, and uh, get a little bit of a preview of what's to come for the Winnipeg Jets over the next little while. And then you're all going to be happy about this, folks. It's been a minute, but um, our guy, Marata Tesh of The Athletic, is back off holidays and back on Winnipeg Sports Talk. And we've got an extensive conversation with Marat because while there hasn't been many things that have happened since we last spoke, here we are with training camp just around the corner. And I think you're really going to enjoy the conversation we uh, have with Marat a little bit later on in the program. And we can't forget about the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. Yesterday after the show, got a chance to catch up with Jackson Jeffcoat of the Blue and Gold, talk about the sweep of the Labor Day Classic and the Banjo Bowl, where the team is at right now. And for you folks that love the dogs of Winnipeg Sports Talk, I will tease this, uh, but well, you're going to be very happy when you see towards the end of the Jackson Jeffcoat interview because uh, uh, dogs will be present and accounted for today on WST. So, lots of Jets and Bomber talk. We'll get Remus in here in just a second, and we will get to that why not question of the day. Uh, but first off, a big thanks to all of our sponsors, including Not Auto Corp, Princess Auto, Cool Bet Canada, as well as Consolidated Supply, Vita Health Fresh Market, Wallace and Wallace, Aikens Lake, Royal Sports, F Apparel, Boston Pizza, Culligan Water, Canadian Club Whiskey, our friends at Breezy Bend Golf and Country Club, the Nick and Nicky DQ Group, Little Brown Jug Brewing, and of course, Assiniboia Downs. Let's get to it and welcome Michael Remus into the program, as well as everybody joining us live on YouTube. Uh, and if you're watching the show after the fact, make sure, if you haven't already, that you're subscribed to the channel. Hit that red button and join us daily. If you're able to, live at 1 p.m., and if not... As soon as you are ready, you'll uh, pop into YouTube and the freshest WST content will be ready for you. Remo, what's going on? I'm feeling good. I'm fired up here, Hus. Yesterday, show, first of all, I think this is a great week. The week you'll be talking about the Bombers win at the Banjo Bowl. We got the Jets roster yesterday and now today, finally on the ice for the first time. Sorry, Jets, Young Stars roster. They'll be on the ice at the Iceplex and we'll actually have a game. And everyone's asking, where can I watch these Young Stars games? The Jets doing a great job on YouTube. They've already scheduled the three games, um, Friday at 6 p.m., Sunday, and Monday. So you check out on their YouTube. You can just, you know, you can uh, hit notify me, and I think it'll ding you uh, when they start, give you a nice reminder. So I know we're all on YouTube here having a great time. So the Jets doing a, a nice job on there as well. Yeah, so we'll get the uh, 411 on uh, everything going on out in Penticton, as well as upcoming uh, Royal Rookie Camp, which I guess technically is underway today with the skate, uh, as well as training camp coming up next week. And obviously looking forward to hearing from Jamie on what the team has planned um, from a content department as well with the addition of Sarah Orleski. I imagine that I would hope fans will, uh, you know, in addition to have uh, the great work that he and Mitch and Paul Edmonds bring on game days and throughout the year, uh, as well with the big addition of Sarah uh, for fans to get more Winnipeg Jets content from the team. Um, Rewell, let's get into this, and we're going to touch on this with Marat a little bit later on. Uh, but I figure this is a good spot to start uh, the Why Not Question of the Day, or actually just quickly before that, we got some great comments from yesterday's Why Not Question of the Day on you know which young player 
you're most looking forward to seeing play in this Penticton tournament? And we had a number of comments, but we've got a few uh, from Destruction. What up, D? Looking forward to seeing a few guys. Lambert for sure. Lucius and Jilkin is interesting as well. Under the radar guys are Torgerson and Johansson. Torgerson played four games with the Moose, got two goals and three points. He's huge, lives in front of the opposition's net, and he's 19. Uh, Johansson's been injured, but he's supposed to be like a water bug at the back. Some real skill, but very undersized. Um, S. James says Lucius is the guy that in interests me the most. Perfetti is a gimme in the lineup. And yeah, as we talked yesterday, Perfetti's in a very different situation than just about everybody else. But I think needs reps, needs a little bit of gameplay, and that should bode well for him heading into main camp with the veterans. Uh, Dan Schwann says Perfetti, hoping he has a phenomenal year. Uh, I think pretty much everyone share echoes those comments, Dan. And Troy Stevens said it's starting to look like the Jets may be ready to make a massive philosophical change, re-young players compared to the Pomo era. Could it be we'll see Perfetti, Lucius, Hinola, and Sandberg in the lineup this year? That's an interesting question. I would imagine that Chaz Lucius does not project to be a Winnipeg Jet this season, but I guess we're really thinking in terms of training camp at the beginning of the year. I think a lot of that you know, kind of depends on how he shows at training camp and presumably starting the year with the Manitoba Moose. But the one thing, Reem, and we'll get to this with the guys when they join us on the program, especially at forward, well, far more, far more than defense, um, there is spots and there is opportunity if someone wants to step up and grab one. Now, I don't think we're ready for that conversation for a guy like Lucius yet, having not really seen him play. But a strong uh, weekend in Penticton, a great rookie camp, and maintaining that into training camp with some good performances in preseason games and a new head coach and a new look behind the bench, I'm not willing to rule anything out. So maybe Troy's on to something. I think with the fact that they have not added more veteran talent and beefed up that forward group, um, there's no doubt that there's probably more opportunity for young players in a position like Chad Lucius than they, Chaz Lucius than there has been before. I still don't expect him to, you know, play much in the National Hockey League this year. But I'd love to be surprised differently if he's able to earn a spot and barge his way into the uh, into the NHL. Yeah, I was going through the comments yesterday, and I love reading all the comments after the show. Go through and uh, respond to pretty much. All of them. We got some good ones yesterday. People really interested in having their take in on who they're excited to see. And I saw that question from Troy Stevens. And my first thought is, was I don't think, you know, Lucius is going to make it. I see B.A. split saying very slim. He plays for the Jets. But I think there is a path for him to play a game. If you're saying, will he play is the over under at 0.5 games. I think there is a path for him to get in. Let's say he has a strong pick to camp. He has a strong uh, you know, time with the Moose. He stays healthy. Meanwhile, the Jets struggle. Um, they can't score goals. They have a number of injuries to their top six. And you have this guy who's performing on the Moose. I do think there's a path. Is it likely? Um, maybe not, but will he get one gimme game at the end of the year for a, you know, for a job well done on the season? Will they, will they do that? I, I don't know, but I think it's an interesting question. Like, how many do you think he'll get into a game? Uh, he was just saying, like, we could see all of them in a game. Sandberg, Hainala, um, who was he saying? Perfetti and and Lucius. And I get it's certain there's a path for it to happening. Yeah, it, it, there is. And I mean, heck, I mean, listen, I, I guess you could most certainly reward some players for strong seasons with some spot duty towards the end of the year. Um, but, I mean, honestly, when you look at the way the Jets right now and the way the roster's constructed, um, you know, if there are some injuries, um, you know, I mean, I, I think the logical spot would be for, you know, maybe a borderline player, a guy like a Jeff Malott might get an opportunity before, you know, a raw rookie uh, in his 19-year-old year. But the other thing, too, is it's a it's a young man's game right now. And, and listen, I'm sort of with B.A. I think it's unlikely that it happens this year. But at the same time, we may have be having a very different conversation after seeing a little bit of Chaz Lucius over the course of uh, the next two or three weeks. So 
first things first, it'll start in Penticton. It technically starts today with being on the ice in the first organized team activities as a professional now that he's moved on from the NCAA. Uh, but he certainly will be a player that, you know, individuals will be paying close attention to. And we'll talk more about that with JT coming up in just a few minutes. Uh, but let's get to today's why not question of the day. Now, uh, for our friends at Not Auto Corp at Waverly and McGilvery, and of course, you can check out everything they've got going online at not.ca as well as the Winnipeg Car Lab. The Edmonton Oilers still apparently, according to Ryan Rashog and people in that market, are looking to potentially move Jesse Puglia-Yarvi. And I was listening to Dusty today on 1260 on his show in the morning, um, you know, ideally looking, I mean, they need to shave some salary off the uh, off the books. Um like, would they like to keep them? I'm sure they would, but they're in a bit of a jam with what they've added this year. And uh, it sounds like they're looking to potentially move RV for what would be a draft pick. Now, he said a first round pick's a pipe dream. They were talking about potentially Anaheim with three second round picks next year. Would a second round pick be movable for a player like PRV? And I would say that's a possibility. But for the Winnipeg Jets, our why not question of the day today and hit us up in the comments with what you think. Your thoughts on Pugliarvi and what would you give up from this Winnipeg Jets roster considering Edmonton needs to shed salary um, to get Pugliarvi in here? You could go with a draft pick and that is certainly a, a, an answer that would be great. But when I look at this, and I'll throw this out to you and I'm going to hit Marat with this a little bit later on. Um... You know, Logan Stanley's in an interesting situation. I still do believe that the organization believes in him and thinks that he's got a solid NHL future. But it's a different story this year now with Billy Hanelis seemingly ready and Dylan Sandberg seemingly ready to get into the lineup. And then you've got those five veteran defensemen all with at least two more years left on their contracts on the Jet Blue Line. Um, what would people think about a Logan Stanley trade uh, and potentially you might have to add in a mid to later round draft pick with that to sweeten the pot to bring Jesse Pujarvi here to Winnipeg. Pujarvi, I'm just going to bring up Edmonton right here. Pujarvi right now uh, is signed for the upcoming year at $3 million and then will be a RFA with arbitration. Logan Stanley's making $900,000 this year. And the reason why when I look at this and I think that it's worth the conversation is that um, you know, the Edmonton Oilers would get a little bit of support on their back end. Uh, they'd have it with a player that, you know, potentially could project into an NHL regular for them in the future at less than a million dollars. Um, you know, there might be a mid or late round pick, as I mentioned, depending on what that market is and what gets worked out. Uh, I'll throw that out there as a possibility. Um, and they get more than $2 million in cap space. And I've been saying it all along. I was thinking more along the lines of moving one of the veteran players that's making considerably more than $900,000 like Logan Stanley uh, out and bringing in a forward that might be making that one to $2 million more than the defenseman that move out that has moved out. But I'm pretty clear. I'm pretty sure Reem that those conversations have been happening all summer long. And I don't think the Winnipeg Jets have liked the market. And I don't think that they felt that the value for what they'd be giving up makes them a better hockey team or makes them sense for them to do that right now. Um, considering the need for talent up front, and I think a guy with you know some strong underlying numbers certainly seems like he's a fun guy to have around within the room and within the team. Um, and a guy that you know maybe a change of scenery could do a lot for is attractive. There's not a long-term commitment on it. And a player like Logan Stanley this year, as opposed to years before, I think might potentially be the odd man out more than he was before. And to me, it makes sense. So hit us up in the comments. Why not question of the day, what you would be willing to give up to get a Yessi Pugliarvi. And if you'd like to comment on my thought of sort of who says no, or does anyone say no between a Pugliarvi to Winnipeg for Logan Stanley and potentially a mid to late round draft pick. Um, does that make sense for the Winnipeg Jets to do? Or is that something the Edmonton Oilers would say no, even with getting the two plus million dollar cap relief in that deal? What do you think? Yeah, I think you're making a lot of sense here. Huss, uh, just going over the Rashog tweet, he said, you know, a couple of days ago, September 12, continuing to pursue all trade options. 
for Pugliarvi. The most obvious move to clear, clear out some cap space. If it doesn't happen, they can start with what they've got, but it'll be razor-thin margin budget-wise and could cause issues later in the season. And he doesn't believe Barry is a trade option. Uh, I've, I'm assuming because we've seen expensive defensemen uh, aren't really, no one's really interested in them for any assets. That's me adding that, but then I'll continue. Uh, they'll start the year with what they have on the blue line, see how it goes. Pairings feel up in the air as well. May take shape. And so they're not going for a PTO. So it seems like they're looking to shore up the D. They're looking to shed salary. And they, so I feel like if they could have, you know, would have already traded him for draft picks, if they could, we saw Bjorkstrand traded for picks uh, in the summer. <laughs> So a guy who's cheap, who's got size, which you know teams love. They love size. How He's can six, you? Seven. How can you resist a six seven defenseman? And I kind of agree. It seemed like Dylan Sandberg hmm. overtook him in the depth chart at the end of the season. Seems to make a lot of sense. So I wonder if they do that. But well, the Jets, or the Jet, what are they going to do with their logjam of defense? And something's got to give there with the Jets and. And Pugliarvi would be a perfect player for them. They need a guy who can play, you know, top of the top of the lineup on the wing. Uh, big guy, go to the net. He can go to the net, bang and pucks. You know, some people say he didn't really convert on a lot of his chances last year, but uh, I think your guy Dusty's number one member of the Pugliarvi fan oh, club. Oh, so. listen, I would lo- I would love that if for no other reason um, to be able to. Talk about Pajarvi all year long with Dusty in the lock shop and when he's on a program and have him be envious of us grabbing a guy that um, was so popular there in Edmonton um, and certainly has a lot of potential as a National Hockey League player. Um, the one thing I'll say, and you mentioned, and I agree, I mean, at the end of the year, it really did seem like Dylan Sandberg had popped in and, you know, sort of jumped Logan, um, you know, as far as that depth chart. Um, but is that the organizational depth chart or was that the depth chart of, uh, does the depth chart change, I guess, with Rick bonus coming in as the head coach. Um, and maybe that's something that needs to happen in, in, in training camp right now. I mean, see where Logan Stanley's it is, is to start the year, see where Dylan Sandberg is to start the year, see how Billy Hanel is looking and reevaluate it at that point. I think they've got a pretty good idea about the veteran defenseman. And I think that if there was a deal to be made, that probably has happened already. Although I think a lot of things can change based on the preseason, potential injuries, and how guys look coming into camp in other cities in and around the league. So while I won't rule out what we talked about for a good portion of the summer, potentially moving out one of the five veteran defensemen, well, I think it's a much smaller group than five. I don't think Josh Morrissey's going anywhere, that's for sure. Um, But one of the vets and bring back a more established player that comes with a bigger price tag. I mean, I still think that would make sense for the Winnipeg Jets if it was out there. Um, but if it's not, where's Logan Stanley? And if he's not playing, or if he's a seventh defenseman for the Winnipeg Jets, are you better off, you know, getting a player like Pugliarvi to come in in a prove it year, still under team control, um, and see if he can, you know, start off fresh in a new environment and make an impact. Um, the, the one thing I'll tell you is that it makes a lot of sense just from the logistics of it. We've been saying all year long, the ability to move a little bit of the cap dispersal from the blue line to the forward group would be good for the Winnipeg Jets. And at the same time, we talk about the opportunity that's there for some of the young players playing in Penticton and potentially this season. I think it's also a big opportunity for a younger player like a Jesse Pugliarvi that has been in and out of favor in Edmonton so far in his career to come in and um, and make an impact in Winnipeg and help this Winnipeg Jets team be a little bit deeper from 1-12 to 12 in their forward group. Yeah, I, I think it makes a lot of sense for the Jets roster. We didn't even mention, oh yeah, he is right-handed, which we know they don't have too many of those. What is it, Chafley, Wheeler, Gagne? Now... <laughs> I got to check that more. That is one thing for all the stats and everything that I look at and we talk about. I rarely rarely know who is right. I mean, we know on Winnipeg who's right and who's not just because 
you know, at times on the power play, it was an issue and, you know, it was so heavily skewed on one time. But I'm glad you brought that up. That's another reason why he might be a nice addition to, they uh, still, to the Winnipeg Jets group. Now they signed Gagne, do we still need to talk about how many, the lack of right-handed shots on the Jets or is, is guy did Gagne fix that? I guess Pugliari would be higher than Gagne in the lineup, um, you know, if they did trade for him. But he, I think he would be a fit. And, you know, the, we've been talking about which forward should the Jets sign. Evan Rodriguez just signed this week with Colorado, and we had another one today. We had talked about the Jets, you know, being possibly a fit. Tyler Mott signing with uh, Ottawa for, you know, for a year and what is it, one point three five million. The summer of uh, Pierre Dorian continues, but <laughs> it just seems like the Jets are having such a tough time signing players here. You know, we know about Yarn Croak and Heinen trading for a guy would be the next way to get a guy here. So um, they do have cap room. I think it makes sense. We were talking about since the summer, but maybe something happens here because it seems like I thought Edmonton, you know, they're like, ah, we couldn't trade him. We've moved on. We're just going to keep the guy. But they've got some salary cap issues that they need to free up. Yeah, well, so we'll talk about this and much more with Murata Tesh coming up in a few minutes on the program. Uh, but next up, we're going to get a bit of a preview of everything that's happening with the Winnipeg Jets and the rookie camp, the Penticton tournament with Jamie Thomas of Jets TV. Uh, and we will have a bomber update a little bit later on. Uh, great news, though, from yesterday. Brandon Alexander, full participant in practice, although a couple more injuries coming out of the banjo bowl. Nick Taylor in a walking boot and Drew Wolitorski with a brace on his knee. Not expected oh, yeah. to play over the next little bit. Um, all right. Hit, up, uh, hit us up in the comments with your thoughts on our Why Not question of the day as well. We'll have some more feedback from you guys later on today and as well as on tomorrow's show if you're getting the con if you're getting the show afterwards. Um, before we bring in JT, I want to welcome in and thank our newest sponsor, the gang over at Consolidated Supply. Shout out to Joe and Spicy, great longtime listeners of the program. And it's great to have Consolidated Supply on board. Now, they've been huge in the golf industry for a long time and really have been the irrigation experts as well as artificial turf. Um, whether you're working on big improvements for irrigation, DIY irrigation solutions for your lawn going into next season, they can help you with that. Um, but if you are looking to put in artificial turf on your property, they are the leaders in that here in Winnipeg. And hey, maybe you're making that want to put that dream putting green or a little operation in the back. Um, Joe and the guys can absolutely help you with that over at Consolidated Supply. Uh, they are the club cart dealer in Winnipeg. So if you need a golf cart to own, golf carts to rent, or even something maybe for the shop, uh, two, four, six passenger ones, uh, they are a wild right now. Go down and see them for yourself. And if you want to trick one out, they can help you for that, that as well. And if you are thinking about more additions to the backyard, hot tubs, outdoor kitchens, and so much more that you might not realize is at Consolidated Supply. So check them out online at cte.ca or pop down and visit them at 1395 Niagara Road East. Our friends at Vita Health Fresh Market have been with us for a long time, and this is a great time to reintroduce yourself to some of the offerings at Vita after that long weekend with the return of NFL season. Uh, hey, everyone wants to eat well, eat healthy, and shop local, and Vita Health Fresh Market is Winnipeg's best selection of local, organic, and natural groceries, supplements, and beauty products, all at great prices, with an amazing staff knowledgeable on all these products to help you get exactly what you need. If you're into organic produce, local grass-fed meats, they've got you covered. They've also got a great grab-and-go deli with fresh and healthy Vita Market salads, sandwiches, and soups to go ready for you at any of the four, any of the seven Winnipeg locations, including the newest store in Linden Ridge. And check them out online at their fully shoppable website at myvita.ca. Uh, of course, our friends at Wallace and Wallace are the uh, fencing leaders in town, but getting a lot of great feedback from Winnipeg Sports Talk customers that have dealt with them for their garage doors. Michael Remus being one of them. Um, Wallace and Wallace, not only the fencing specialist, but they work with Clopay, the largest garage door manufacturer in the world. And despite supply chain issues we've all been experiencing in recent months, you can still get a beautiful new garage door delivered and installed in less than four weeks, just in time for the crazy back to 
school fall and winter season. And speaking of doors, did you know that a new garage door can add up to 4% to the value of your home? 161 styles of garage doors to choose from. There's definitely a style that's right for your home. Talk to the experts at Wallace Doors online, wallacedoors.com. Give them a call or pop down and visit them in person on at their showroom on Lawson Road. And a big thank you to our friends at Aikens Lake. Saw Cole Perfetti and Connor Hellebuck out at Aikens on the weekend uh, as part of the True North Foundation fishing trip. The guys both banging out some big ones on the lake. And as amazing as the fishing is at Aikens Lake, I always tell people it is the people, the hospitality that make it even better. Uh, the Turin family, absolutely the best. If you're thinking about making a plan to get out to Aikens next year, Get on it now. It's filling up at Aikens Lake on uh, AikensLake.com online, or you can contact them on any of their socials at Aikens Lake as well. All right. Jackson Jeff go to the Bombers later on. The return of Murata Tesh. But right now, I believe we're going out to the Iceplex to welcome in our good friend, a.k.a. the Commish, Jamie Thomas. And Listen, I could easily talk about week one of the National Football League, but uh, the day job calls and uh, a lot going on around the Iceplex. How are you, my friend? It's great to have you back on WST. Uh, listen, after you beat me this past weekend in the What Would Taco Do League, I wasn't going to do this, but I owe you one because I missed one of our hits. So <laughs> so we're, here we are. <laughs> I made fun of your first round pick of Travis Kelsey in our pool, and look what he does. He burns me. So <laughs> and you get a terrible week from Aaron Rodgers, and you still win. Like there are so many things, but I'm not going to talk about. Yeah, yes, I, we're I back love the, I love the fact that on our site now we can give players nicknames, and I give it a very it. derogatory name to Aaron Rodgers. <laughs> and I'm in the market for another quarterback. The rest of the team looks good. I don't want to deal with Rodgers all season long, especially with those rookie receivers. Uh, speaking yeah, of rookies, yeah. the rookies yes. are on the ice today. Uh, you got that good mm -hmm. uh, new season feeling. Uh, fill us in on uh, what the atmosphere is like around there and uh, the fresh young faces in the organization that have popped in over the last few days that are on the ice today, JT. Yeah, I mean, anytime you can come into the rink and there's three first round picks, the Winnipeg Jets, I think you could be pretty happy about that. Right. And I think that is one of the things that stands out for this, uh, the young star tournament that's going to be in Penticton this weekend. Uh, the Jets will open up against the Edmonton Oilers and it's great to have the gang all back, right? Ordinarily this tournament has uh, Winnipeg, Edmonton, Calgary, Vancouver. The two previous editions I went to were it was just Vancouver. Uh, the one I went to in Belleville was Montreal and Ottawa's prospects along with the Jets. So this is the first time I've been around for the full Young Stars effect. But, you know, Cole Perfetti, Brad Lambert, and, of course, um, that, that Chaz Lucius, right? That, that's some star power right there for the Winnipeg Jets. And it is great to be back. It's, it's been far too long since we've been in the rink. Uh, it was a tremendous summer weather-wise. But as soon as that, you know, the calendar turns to September, it's great to be back here and uh, see all the – new faces and not so new faces uh, for the Jets prospects here at the Iceplex. Um, so Jamie, how are things going to work? I mean, they're on the ice today. Is there a couple practices yeah. before they end up going out to, to Penticton? And um, is Rick bonus involved? Is it Jimmy Roy and Mike Keene? I mean, uh, how is the organization handling um, introducing these guys into the organization uh, as well as, you know, making things happen for actual game action uh, out West? Yeah, it's the Manitoba Moose coaching staff. So Mark Morrison and company, uh, of course, Nolan Baumgartner joining the coaching staff this year. Uh, they're handling practice and they'll be the, the guys behind the bench uh, in Penticton. So that that is who will be running things here. But, uh, you know, great group of guys. Uh, love, the, love the Moose coaching staff. You get to get to know them a little bit more because, as you know, when the Winnipeg Jets season started, you don't get as many opportunities to talk to the Moose coaching staff. So uh, there was physicals today and you get to see the fine specimens that the Jets have drafted and have brought in a personal trial contracts. But man, it's, uh, it's so good to be back, buddy. A lot of so much speculation over the off season. And now you get to start talking to the guys for real. And, uh, so, you know, I saw a lot Adam Lowry and company a little bit earlier here today at the ice, Pla ice plex as well. Uh, just on the big club, because we won't spend a lot of time talking about that right now. Um, yeah. Are most of the guys back and skating? I, I'm not sure how many guys were out there right now. We've seen pictures the team's put out of Wheeler and Cole Perfetti. But yeah. I mean, where, where are we at as far as the entire group being here and on the ice? I, I saw, you know, the, the, of course, David Riddick and, and Connor Hellebuck. I'd say about 12 guys were out there from the from the big club, right? So I know it all starts for real, but I believe the majority of the Jets are are in town and ready to go and start skating but i only saw about 12 guys out in the ice today there Huss. 
Uh, Jamie Thomas is with us from Jets TV. Uh, you guys are planning some great coverage out from Penticton. Um, I know mm-hmm. there's a lot of excitement, more so this year than I think in recent Young Stars tournaments. A big yeah. part of that is the reason that there's three first-rounders in this lineup that you just mentioned. Um, mm-hmm. Fill us in on what you guys have planned, how people are going to be able to see the games, and uh, what else you guys will have content-wise coming out of Penticton. Well, the best part is, is I, uh, the, all all the games will be on uh, WinnipegJets.com. All the Jets games, sorry, they'll, they'll, they'll be on WinnipegJets.com. You can see it on the YouTube page. I believe TikTok will be available or part of the process. Hassan, I apologize. Like TikTok, I'm still not fully caught up on. I'm fully how that expecting. All works, but... <laughs> I'm fully expecting you and Edmonds to be doing like yeah. TikTok dances yeah. Yeah. at intermissions. Yeah. I mean, hey, you want to yeah. boost the numbers? Yeah. There's my suggestion for you. I won't even send you a bill for that one. Jamie and hey, Paul doing TikTok dances at intermission. Let's go. Anything with Edmonds boosts everything in terms of uh, social content. So, but uh, Paul, Paul will not be making the journey. We paper scissors rocked over it, and I, I won. So uh, I'll be uh, providing color analysis on all three of the games, and then whoever the Oilers, Jets, and uh, Canucks send in for their play-by-play guy for that one. But also, uh, we're going to do a segment called "Not So Long Walks on the Beach." Uh, I'm going to walk with a couple of three of the Jets prospects on the beach on Okanagan Beach. Hopefully the weather holds up, but uh, it is going to be about two minutes. Really looking forward to kind of getting to know the guys. Uh, Chaz Lucius will be one of our guests. And we're, I believe Simon Lundmark is another one, a second round pick of the Winnipeg Jets on their blue line. I had some time with the uh, Manitoba Moose. So that'll be part of it. And then there'll be some TikToks coming out. Uh, Cameron Henny is uh, one of the guys in our social media department. He's in charge of that, but that will be uh, featuring a lot of the Jets prospects during this tournament. So a lot of fun stuff in store. I will not be taking part of any TikToks. I can tell you that right no, now. No, we need a dance. It's going to be Perfetti coming in, mm. and then Lucius, yeah. and then Lambert, yeah. and then Thomas coming in. Listen, make it all happen. Probably, uh, to make it really awkward, maybe I'll ask them to take off their shoes, and we can walk in the lake while we're having the not-so-long <laughs> walk on the beach. <laughs> take a walk with me. Chaz, let's um, go. <laughs> speaking of TikTok, <laughs> um, folks, uh, make sure you're obviously following at NHL Jets on TikTok and uh, Sports Talk WPG as well. Remus is doing a great job uh, cranking out a bunch of content on that uh, platform as well. And there's a new one today. So if you haven't checked it out so far, now's a great time to remind you to do that. Um, the other guy, you know, we spent a good time talking yesterday um, on our Why Not Question of the Day off the top of the show, JT. Uh, about yeah. who fans were most excited to see. And listen, Cole Perfetti obviously is at the top of the list. He wouldn't normally be in this tournament, I don't think. But no. um, listen, he missed a lot of last season. He's coming back. He didn't play in the World Juniors. So the opportunity to get games against peers, I think, will be great for him, who I think is a lot is going to be counted on uh, once we get to main camp. Um, but one name, you mentioned Chaz Lucius. The other one is the other one of the first rounders, and that's Brad Lambert, who was just picked in this year's draft um, at number 30. Lambert, it, 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 there's fascinating options for Lambert within the organization this year. Seeing mm-hmm. that he's come from Europe, he's a Finnish player, does not have a European deal this year. R- WHL rights are held by the Seattle Thunderbirds, who won the WHL last year. Um, And then, of course, there's the Manitoba Moose option. Um, Mm -hmm. We've heard a lot about what he brings to the table and got, you know, some chances to see him at the World Juniors. Um, Thoughts on Lambert and maybe what's at stake for him over the course of the next little while, as opposed to, you know, deciding where he plays this season. Right. I, I, you know, let's first and foremost, let's deal with the the World Juniors, right? He, He was not part of the roster in the semifinal and final. And, you know, it's, Sometimes people quickly forget that the World Juniors are a 19-year-old tournament, and Finland's uh, roster was loaded with them. So Brad Lambert on the outside looking in, watching uh, for the big parts of that tournament. But he is like I, you know, the Jets said he was the best skater in the draft. I think a lot of scouts went along with that. Um, I got to see him firsthand. Up, this is the first time I've seen him up close. He's got great wheels, and I think that part is makes him uh, a must-watch kind of player. You have to admire the fact that he stayed, instead of going to the Western Hockey League, at the time Saskatoon owned his rights, he chose to stay in Finland and work on a defensive part of his game because he understood that that part of his game needs work. And if you're going to play in the National Hockey League, you have to have that 200-foot game. So the the skill, the skating is there, the skill is all there, but he wanted to work on the defensive aspect of his game. So I, I think not so much that a lot is at stake, but I think we're going to see how comfortable he is right away uh, here playing with the Winnipeg Jets and you would like to see in a tournament with his peers and around the same age group him 
have some dominant performances uh, in the three games uh, in Penticton this weekend. There's no question about that. Now, do I think it's going to hurt him, his chances of what, where he's going to play right away? No, I think that is, is going to be more for main camp. But uh, the, the speed is legit with Brad Lambert. Great hands and tight. It's that's the that's the stuff we're going to be looking for in these three games over the weekend. Well, you know what? I mean, to be fair, I mean, I know we wasn't played in those last couple games for Finland uh, in the yeah. in the tourney. Um, but if you go back, I mean, that was such a weird tournament. It was in the middle of totally. August. If you yeah. go back to the original tournament at Christmas, he had two goals and five points in their first two games. So had a great start, and then. Um, you know, a little bit of an unfortunate second half of the season, but to the benefit of the Jets that he was available for them because no one saw that happening a few weeks ago. And hey, just to correct myself, it, it, his rights are held by Seattle. They went yeah. to the WHL championship last year, but ended up losing in the finals to the Edmonton Oil Kings. But speaking of Seattle, a guy yeah. that might not be a household name to a lot of folks, but if they watch the games this weekend and watch camp, they'll be quite familiar with after a while is Tyrell Bauer. And I yes. just think back, I mean, you can maybe say about what you saw last year in camp. I mean, everyone was talking about him, the aggressiveness, the uh, lack of F's given when it came to going up against veteran NHL players and, He's now part of the organization assigned. I imagine he projects to be a moose this year. Um, but I think he's going to probably turn some heads for folks that haven't seen what Bauer's done before now that he's transitioning from a great five years in the Western Hockey League to being a pro. Especially being a six-round pick in 2020, and he's a big kid. Like He's wearing a yellow jersey today, so I think he's a little bit nicked up to start uh, this, this turn or this rookie camp, but I mean, the fact that he overcame a season-ending knee, like a, a knee injury, fought back through that, was named the captain of the Seattle Thunderbirds, led them within two games. The Memorial, or sorry, the Western Hockey League Championship. He is tough, though, and you're right. There is absolutely no fear in his game, and it provides a lot of size in the back end uh, for the Winnipeg Jets in this rookie tournament. But I, I'm looking forward to seeing how this this kid fits in because the fact that you add some grit and tenaciousness and some leadership. Uh, and if, if it's going to be the Manitoba Moose, then 100, percent you're going to love that. And and, and more kind of that log jam within the system of the Jets, right? You, the back end is really you're looking down to the Moose, and a little bit further than that, they've done a great job stockpiling NHL cal or pro worthy defensemen. So um, certainly a strength within the organization. But I I love anybody that likes to throw the weight around. Um, and anybody that likes it, there's no fear of dropping the gloves either. And Tyrell Bauer is that kid and also comes from my hometown of Cochran, Alberta. So it never uh, knock those types of guys. <laughs> um, <laughs> hey, by the way, if you're with us on YouTube or if you're listening to the podcast, you're wondering where to find it. The broadcasts are already planned on the Jets YouTube. And if you go yeah. to the description of today's show, the links are all there along with with Jamie's Twitter feed, which you should also be following for some great coverage throughout the year. Um, JT, before we go, uh, have you talked to Bones much now yet? Uh, have you had many interactions with the new head coach of the Jets? Just wondering how he's fitting in and uh, sort of the atmosphere that seems to surround him going into this upcoming training camp. Yeah, I unfortunately only got, well, not unfortunately, I was fortunate enough to sit down with him the first day of the, before his uh, media availability uh, here in Winnipeg, but have not run into him. But, you know, as, as we tend to do, us, we, we phone around to our peers, we, we text people, what's he like, what's this guy about? And, and Dan Murphy, who is a longtime uh, sports network reporter in Vancouver, said one of his favorite human beings, uh, knowing Murph as long as I have, I'll go with that. And for the most part, it just, you know, just exudes not so much confidence, but positivity um, has the, the right idea of what he wants to do with this hockey club and uh, shore up on that defensive side of things. And uh, just that new voice maybe that they've always, that, that they've needed for some time. And uh, I'm all for anybody that's uh, ready to help this team get better defensively uh, and do it uh, and knows how to deal with us. I mean, there's no lack of experience in that department from bones in that way. And uh, so can't wait to, hop on that first charter with bones and, and the rest of the coaching staff and see how, how this is going to work out. Hey, Jamie, uh, one other big off season addition, not necessarily on the ice, but off the ice was uh, Sarah Orleski. I know everyone's very excited to have her in the fold. Um, I'm not sure how much, you know, or can tell us right now, but um, just give us a bit of an idea about how um, the content uh, department is going to maybe be beefed up uh, with you, Mitch, Paul doing your things, but also the addition of, of Sarah and what fans can look forward to having her in the fold. 
Yeah, and you know what? Sarah's interviewing is second to none, right? And that's one of the big reasons why they brought her aboard. Uh, hopefully to get a little bit more access than in years past. Um, we already saw her sit down with Mark Shifley. So Sarah's going to be able to spend a little more time, not since she's not traveling, uh, a lot more time working on the, on the feature side of thing, right? And uh, unfortunately with myself, Mitch and Paul and Tyler Esquivel and, and Daniel Moss just haven't been able to commit the amount of time that is necessary to get those features and to allow our fans to know a little bit more about the players. And I know COVID's played a large role in that, but with the dressing rooms opening up um, and Sarah and the full tier, I think we're going to get to know the Jets players a lot more than we have and, and the coaching staff because it's a new coaching staff. Um, so I think that's, that's going to be a big benefit for Jets fans this year. And also to let people know, like Paul and I have our game day podcast that we're, we call it flyby. We're going to start doing a thing called Twitter spaces where you can just do it right in and people can tune in uh, from anywhere. And, it, it keeps the uh, technology part of things out of Paul and I's hands, which is the best thing to do is we can just do what we do and answer questions. And uh, we're going to have guests throughout the year from the other teams. And so people will be able to tune in at, at a set time. We're not sure the set time, but it'll be the, the same time every time there's a game day, unless it's an afternoon game. And we'll figure that out. But looking forward to taking, doing more on Twitter spaces as the year goes on. And, and so happy that Sarah has joined us because uh, Jets fans deserve some more coverage of this team and, and some more behind the scenes stuff. And I believe that's what we're going to del deliver this year in 2022 and 23. Well, I'm looking forward to the Twitter space. I'm glad the tech people yeah. have been able to dumb it down for you guys and make it as simple <laughs> as possible. Just, because at the just end of the push, day... <laughs> just push the mic. Just turn your mic on. That's it. That's all we have to do. And that's the best part. So, <laughs> Hey, one more thing before we go. We sort of talked about yeah. some of the forwards and the defense. Um, you know, the goaltenders uh, at this event yeah. are intriguing. Um, we've yeah. seen Arvid Holm. Artur Salmon in the uh, the Finn that was signed last year out of the Finnish league, and uh, the uh, the young goaltender um, Dom is Divincentis. 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 Yeah. Seventh yeah, round Dominic pick. Yeah. Dominic um, Yeah. I would say that this more so than normal years um, is quite intriguing because of how um, Divincentis. I'm sure will be going back to junior, but the other two um, could be very central figures for the Manitoba Moose this year. And, you know, depending on what happens with injuries and whatnot, uh, as well as projecting into the future, could be pretty key parts of this uh, of this organization. Um, I know you've seen home before, uh, but uh, yeah. just maybe thoughts on the goalies that are going to be getting a shot to play out in Penticton and how they might figure into the plans for the team, either at the AHL level or NHL level. Right, and I think Arvin Holm, it took him a little bit to get adapted to the North American game. Big goaltender, right? And, and I think the latter half of the season, the, the Moose and the Jets were happy with his performance. And then Salmon and another big, lanky goaltender who led the uh, Liga in wins and saves. And we've heard that before with Connor Hellebuck, right? A very busy goaltender in, in the uh, Finnish Elite League. So we'll see how he fits into the Moose plans. Of course, with Mikhail Burden as well. I'm, I'm assuming they'll have three goaltenders this year. And Dominic DiVincentis, uh, a, a great story, right? He, he led all Ontario Hockey League rookies and wins last year. Will likely be the starting goaltender with his Ontario Hockey Club goal uh, this year. Um, the best part of it was is he waited patiently and, pa and patiently and patiently for his name to be called uh, in Montreal. And it was the, one of the loudest cheers when his name was called. He had a lot of a big support group, a uh, big friend with uh, McGordy, the uh, Jets first first round pick this year they're they're tight so i'm um, looking forward to seeing how dominic divincentis goes but uh, you know what i the draft is such goes by so quickly and we always look at the first and second round guys but you gotta love the seventh round guys that are just thrilled at the opportunity of hearing their name called and you can't help but not pull for them so i'm assuming the three goaltenders will each get one game throughout this tournament so i'm sure we'll see all three and that is that that the plan as of this moment of how that's going to work out Jamie, uh, enjoy the first day back on the grind officially with Jet yeah. players on the ice. Uh, have a great trip out. Yeah. And we'll look forward to seeing uh, everything that you guys have from the Young Stars event over the next few days. And looking forward to having you back here on the program when you're back in the peg. And uh, we got the big boys up on, on the ice in uh, the coming weeks. We sure do. And I'm glad you finally named your team, Huss, after the big win on, in week one. So uh, all the best. Big red. Big red. <laughs> you know it. Take it easy. Good luck. Oh, Better yeah. luck in week two. Shout out to, Thanks, shout out to Big Red. <laughs> Thanks so much. There's Jamie Thomas uh, of the uh, Winnipeg Jets. Um, 
I'm really looking forward to this event. We're going to talk about it more with Murat Atesh coming up in just a few minutes. Bomber fans, stick around, though. A great chat with Jackson Jeffcoat coming up on today's edition of Winnipeg Sports Talk as well. Um, keep on those uh, answers, whether in the chat or especially in the YouTube comments of the show on our why not question of the day today. What would you be prepared to give up? Or do would you like the Jets to try to acquire Yessi Pugliarvi? And what cost would make sense for the Winnipeg Jets? Uh, you can do that in the comments. Um, and uh, a big thanks to Not Auto Corp for their great support of Winnipeg Sports Talk since day one. Um, and listen, if you're in the market or even considering an upgrade or a new vehicle for you and your family, First things first, get on down to Not Auto Corp. See the incredible array of vehicles that they have on the lot changing daily and weekly. Um, and if you're thinking about an electric vehicle, Not's been the leaders in Tesla sales for years here in Manitoba. And they've got a new Tesla experience program to get you all the information you need to know on a transition from a traditional vehicle to driving electric. Um, uh, and bottom line is, if there's this particular make and model that you've got your heart set on, there's no better people to help you source it, find it, and get it here to Winnipeg and get you into it at the best possible price. That's our friends at Knot. Why not get into the car of your dreams at a great deal with the help of the Knot team? Pop down and see him, Waverly and McGilvery, along with the Winnipeg Car Lab, or check them out online at knot.ca. Well, we got jet season coming up. NFL is back. The Bombers are making another push for a third consecutive Grey Cup. It's all happening right now. And if you need to update your gear for your favorite team, you know where to do that. Royal Sports, our good friends down at 750 Pembina Highway. Uh, not only do they have the greatest selection of merchandise, maybe anywhere in Canada, to be honest, if you've ever seen the stock and merchandise they have uh, but they're also the hockey leaders in Winnipeg for over 35 years hiring players to help you get the best equipment to make the biggest difference in your game Royal Sports 750 Pemina Highway get ready to drop the puck and follow them on Instagram as well at Royal Sports Pemina for the latest merchandise drops and sale information um, speaking of back to school back to work might be time to get a bit of an upgrade in that wardrobe department and the gang over at F apparel are ready for you. I can tell you personally, both myself and Michael Remus just went through the process of meeting with Andrew and his staff, finding out the options for suits, what sort of colors, what sort of materials, um, and of course, getting suited up and fitted for it. And uh, now we're back. We'll have a challenge for you soon. We will do another suit show very soon in the future. Uh, but if you need to upgrade the wardrobe, get on down custom suits beginning at just $400. All the accessories you need as well at great, great prices. F Apparel is the spot. They're at 190 Smith Street downtown. Find out more or make an appointment to go in and see them at F. That's E-P-H apparel.com. And uh, hey, we got to give a big shout out to our friends at Breezy Bend. What a great season it's been. They are working on new two new greens for the upcoming season after the great success in the Canadian mid am and senior women's championship at breezy bend. And it's been a, just a few phenomenal years out there. The course has never looked better. The membership's never been healthier. And if you're thinking about a place with a great junior program, social scene, and a perfect home long-term for your family on golf course at one of Winnipeg's top private courses. Breezy is the spot. Hit up our good friend Corey Johnson or find out at the clubhouse or find out more online at breezybend.ca. All right. I know some of you have been saying, where the heck is Marat? Well, Marat took some well-earned time off, but that time off is over, and it's time to welcome Marat Atesh back to Winnipeg Sports Talk to Talk Jets. What is going on? I have some good time off. Get away a bit. I got away. It was great. I I didn't write about a hockey. I did. I barely wrote an email. Hus. Like I, I may have written an Instagram post, some texts. But if anybody is out there who texts me on a regular basis and didn't hear from me, like I kind of ghosted for a little bit. Just had pure R and R. Went to Niagara Falls twice. <laughs> I was telling you before we got on. I'm basically eight years old inside. Um, and, and I had a really, really great re recharge 
And it seems as though the Jets, you know, made huge transformations while I was gone. And, uh, you know, I'm just scrambling to catch up to all the trades and roster news. Yeah, yeah. I tongue firmly planted in cheek on that. I'm not sure that you didn't get a full green light. No problem. Take off for three weeks for a month. We'll be back here just as you left a little bit before, although we will get to the Sam Gagne signing. But listen, I do want to talk about some of the big stories and themes going into camp that you touched on in the athletic piece in a minute. Um, But considering today we've got bodies on the ice and official team activities for the first time in the rookie camp, maybe we should start there. Um, Obviously, the tournament is going on this weekend. It was quite interesting to see Cole Perfetti on the list. And we talked about this yesterday. I'm sure you'd agree. I mean, important for this young man to get some reps after the amount of time that he missed last season. Uh, but who else intrigues you about the uh, the group of prospects that we'll be seeing playing out in Penticton wearing Jets colors on the weekend, Marat? Well, yeah, Cole Perfetti, impossible to miss, impossible to ignore. I mean, that's an NHL job waiting to happen. We all think that as long as he has his health and gets this tune-up, he'll be a contributing member of the the Jets' top nine, maybe even top six. Ideally, that would be how things went for him. But following from that, I mean, a scout once described Chaz Lucius to me as Cole Perfetti without the puck. And by that, it's kind of as if when Cole Perfetti has the puck on his stick, The game slows down for him. He has patience. He has vision. He sees plays before they happen. He makes passes into dangerous areas. And right before he got hurt last year, he was starting to do that on a regular basis at the NHL level. Well, Chaz Lucius is a guy that off the puck sees plays before they happen, darts into space, cuts into the middle. He's not a big guy, but he's not afraid to go to dangerous areas to score. And he can read off of great playmakers in a really in a really elite fashion so far throughout his, you know, his junior aged and college career. So for me, the exciting thing is, and I know it's just rookie camp. I know it's just Young Stars tournament. This is not the National Hockey League against, uh, you know, against the full timers. But this will be the first time we get to see them together. So if there is one two-on-one with the one-timer that uh, Chaz Lucius is able to bury, if there's one piece of chemistry there, that's going to be exciting for me. That's going to be a hopeful look into the future of what these guys might be capable down the road. Um, And in terms of recent first-rounders, even more recent than Lucius and Perfetti, you know, Rucker McGroarty won't be there because he's uh, at college. Um, But Brad Lambert, the incredibly highly skilled, highly talented, you know, some some people say he's the best skater to ever come out of Liga, or at least in the last several years as well. I mean, the guy can fly. And I feel like a situation like this, where the defense is not going to be Dustin Bufflin-esque, let's say, is going to be an opportunity for that person, for that young man, Brad Lambert, to put himself on a highlight reel. And I'll be curious to see how he approaches it and, and who he finds chemistry with and uh, who he fits in with as well. So... You know, there's some real top end talent in terms of the forwards that'll be available, and I'll be I'll just be looking for them to have fun, build relationships. Mm-hmm. You know, there was no mm-hmm. development camp; that was a strange choice, and I know there were injuries and things like that. But Winnipeg needs these guys to bond and start these long, long sort of like the beginnings, the seeds of chemistry that hopefully uh, you know Winnipeg can sow and then reap uh, later in their careers. Well, you know what? It's a great point. And and we'll get back to Perfetti because unlike the rest, I mean, he, as you just mentioned, I mean, not only plans to and penciled in to be a Winnipeg Jet, but could very well be leaned on. And I think right now, look, reading the tea leaves, he will be leaned on to be a top six player, potentially in game number one of the year. Um, But Chaz Lucius, he signed a contract. He'll come in. We would assume that he starts with the Manitoba Moose. You mentioned that connection playing together, whether it's he and Perfetti or potentially he and Brad Lambert. The Lambert situation to me is the most fascinating of all of these players. I mean, we mentioned the pedigree that he had, but we can't mention that without talking about a pretty precipitous drop from where he was expected to be drafted to where he ended up getting selected by the Jets at the bottom of the first round. And Marat, there's the potential that he plays in the Western Hockey League with a very good Seattle team. There's a potential that he plays with the Manitoba Moose. Um, assuming that those are the two options right now, any thoughts from from your side of things as to what makes the most sense? Um, you know, just on your thought about having getting some connection and having these guys together to have two first rounders like Lambert and Chaz Lucius maybe start their North American pro jersey because of course Lambert was playing in the Finnish league uh, last year together with the Moose makes sense. But I think more so than any, he's a unique situation just because 
you know, the worries of, you know, maybe some confidence being affected with a real tough season last year in a year where there was so much pressure on the young man expected to be a high first round NHL draft pick. Yeah, Brad Lambert is a fascinating person, fascinating situation. You know, there were times where he was thought of as, you know, one of the top few picks for that draft. So for Winnipeg to get him towards the end of the first round uh, is an indicator of how he fell. It's tough for any of these youth to get tremendous minutes in Liga, sometimes depending on the playing situation. So if you're a Jets fan, you'll be happy, whether it's the Moose or Junior here in North America, that Brad Lambert's going to get you know some, some more opportunity likely than he would have in Liga. And then it's the interesting thing, because I feel like I can make a case for either situation. Depending on if you zoom in and you go to that you know closed-door meeting behind, um, behind closed doors with coaches and with Lambert, what is the source of the confidence situation? What is the source of um, of the of the precipitous fall that you de- described? And if it's about the guy just needs minutes and he needs to see himself produce, he needs to see himself play a major role with the team, I can make the argument that WHL would be great for him. I mean, he didn't play, uh, like I say, a lot of minutes. He didn't generate a lot of points last year. The offense fell off because opportunity wasn't there. And for me, I'm thinking... Well, maybe there's a long-term play to be had and he plays a full junior season. He'll obviously be, you know, a, a star echelon player in that league. And even if there's some adjustment period to it and he doesn't blow the doors off in the first week, you'd have to imagine by the end of the season, this guy will have put up the numbers that help get him back to playing his game or believing in himself or what have you. And on the other side of things is, you know, I think back to, well, well, I was about to say Kyle Connor and Jack Roslovic. That'd be the last time the two guys this exciting, I think, played at the same time for the Moose. That's a, those are lofty goals to set for these players. But maybe if if he can get the right opportunity, but a measured form of minutes with the Manitoba Moose. Maybe there's something a little more humbling about playing against AHL competition where you're still playing the right way. You're still getting proper opportunity measured out by coaches who want to see you make the NHL. Um, but if there's any sense that, OK, if he goes to the WHL, he'll he'll hot dog or something like this, which may not be fair to put on him. But he is such a highly skilled offense first, uh, extremely fast player that there's almost a risk going too far the other way where he solves the WHL in a season and thinks he's arrived next year as well. And, you know, I'm not in Brad Lambert's head, but. I'm sure that the Jets development team will have had those conversations and tried to make the best estimate of what's going to be best for him in the long term. You know, you it, it's a fascinating comparison to Kyle Connor and Jack Roslovic because uh, certainly when you look at where these players were drafted, I mean, it's pretty much bang on. I mean, it was Connor, I believe, it was 17, and Chaz Lucius was 18, and Jack Roslovic was 25, and Brad Lambert was 30. I mean, they're certainly coming in as you know, mid to late first round picks that have plenty of potential. But the word that you used, which I think is a perfect one about, you know, some young players, star players, first rounders going to the American Hockey League and being humbled a little bit and learning some of the things that you have to learn as to how to survive and how to excel at the pro level is astute. But I'm not sure that that didn't happen last year for Brad Lambert (laughs) in Liga. And that is maybe leaning me more towards the possibility of our big confidence building season to get back to made him the player that was a potential top five pick in last year's draft playing more and with more success, albeit against lesser competition in the WHL. Yeah, I would like the idea. And I think that's why, like, you know, maybe I'm 60, 40 in favor of that, where I can see the idea where I'd want him to be able to not just so tear it up, so to speak, But to also have his first slump and then his first recovery from that slump as well, right? And, you know, against uh, men in Liga, you know, the minutes go down and then they never come back up or the offense goes away for a minute and it doesn't get a chance to to really recover. In the WHL, he'd be such an important player that if he goes cold for a week or hits a bunch of posts or something like that, he'll be able to see what it's like to keep at it and get that offense back because they're not cutting his minutes from first line to fourth line or something to that effect. And I think that in the long run, like that could be a valuable lesson. And then at the same time, the reason for the 40% is you talk to Cole Perfetti and, you know, he has nothing but time for the AHL and its impact on his development as a, as a teenager as well. And 
you know, I like the trajectory that Perfetti is on uh, too, but he would have been coming from an OHL season where, especially in the back half of his draft year, he was he was really tearing it up. And maybe that's just the thing that Lambert needs at this stage, and we shouldn't be getting too far ahead of ourselves based on his skill set and pedigree. Yeah, no, I mean, it's an astute point. And the one thing I'll say, I mean, we've served so many times before with the Jets, you know, lamenting the fact that if you take Canadian players – you know, that year after their draft, they're not eligible to play in the American Hockey League um, because I think they, you know, all things being equal, they'd prefer to have the guys here in the city be closer to the organization and play pro and be closer to the National Hockey League. But Lambert is such a unique case. Um, and, and that's why I think he probably is the most intriguing player when we get to training camp, development camp, and of course, this event coming up this weekend out in Penticton. One other thing that did happen, there wasn't a lot, but one thing that did happen while you were gone was the signing of Sam Gagne. And listen, I mean, it goes to say we were expecting far more action this year for the Winnipeg Jets in the offseason. Uh, a uh, low-risk, one-year, bargain-basement, $750,000 signing of a veteran player doesn't move the needle that, that much. Um, but I do think he brings a lot to the Winnipeg Jets in areas of need. What do you think about that and uh, Sam Gagne's fit in with the Winnipeg Jets coming here at this stage in his career? Yeah, I like Sam Gagne. I'm a, I'm a fan of Sam Gagne as, you know, as a person from afar we've never met, but just in terms of his interactions with media or his, you know, his role on previous teams, whether it's Detroit recently. I mean, he went as low as the AHL for a couple of stints and has done everything that he uh, in his power to extend his career and do everything and stay healthy and get to this opportunity. So, you know, I have a lot of respect for a player in that situation. Similarly, you hear good things. You hear that he's a great fit in dressing rooms, that he's a positive, optimistic person, and that he's easy to get along with. And, you know, that is the Winnipeg Jets late summer staple, whether it's Matt Hendricks, Nate Thompson, Mark Letestu, you go down the list. It's, it's expected that a player of this, of this nature is, is brought on Riley Nash even last summer as well. But the unique thing about Gagne is that instead of sort of his bread and butter being on the defensive side of the game, as many of those players were, you know, he's had strong offensive seasons in the NHL. And so he doesn't have the wheels of a, of a Nikolai Ehlers or he doesn't have, you know, that explosiveness or, or shot that you're going to expect a, a really strong offensive season for. Like if you're looking at the, I think it's 33 points he put up last year in Detroit. And you're thinking, well, okay, well, he's hit 48 before. Okay, there's a 50-point player. That, like, I, I don't think that's a realistic expectation. But the hands and the vision are still there. And that makes him an, an intri intriguing, I want to say, utility knife type player. Like, if Winnipeg needs to spot somebody on the second line for a while, um, you know, Sam Gagne has done that at different stages of his career. If they balance out the line such that the third line isn't pure checking, he may be able to play that role as well. And if you need a fourth line center that just joins the second power play unit, I think that he's capable of all of these different types of roles. And the only thing I would say is, you know, don't expect him to have Paul Stastny's defensive impact. Don't expect him to score 50 points in the season. But he's the sort of player that you like as a 750K, versatile, well-liked, offensively talented, and right-handed forward. Because Winnipeg only, I think, has four of them, with even with him included. Yeah, the right shot was a bonus to everyone in the chat. That's for <laughs> sure. That's a, Those have been rare in and around, especially amongst the forwards groups here in Winnipeg. Um, so here we are. Camp starting next week, and Sam Gagne is the uh, essential addition, along with Rick Bonus. Um, how did we get here? Because I, I'll say it, I don't. I think you would agree. We all expected far more significant change this summer based on what happened last year, what we heard from everyone, including the general manager at the end of the season, Murat. Yeah, we were talking about transformation, weren't we? We were talking about um, this idea that this team needed to do some long, hard reflecting on the season that it had just had and all those sorts of things. And the talk seemed to be that there could be transformative changes. Um, everything from Mark Scheifele in his year-end press conference, you know, saying he loved Winnipeg, but also with two years left on his contract, saying that he wasn't sure what his future held and talking about his future in hypothetical terms. That was an interesting one, especially after the listless, especially defensively listless season that he had had at times. He was also great at times, and that should be noted as well. So you sort of wondered, well, is that going to be a move that they need to make at some point? You don't like the idea of him hitting 31 years old as a 2024 unrestricted free agent and all the offense he's put up. That might be a tough contract to get a lot of value from. Um, 
But you can't move Mark Scheifele if you don't have Pierre-Luc Dubois locked up long term. So I don't know that Winnipeg got really far down the moving Mark Scheifele, you know, uh, uh, road. I think that they like him. I think he's still, you know, a, a well-liked player and all these sorts of things. But that may have been a move that we were talking about that can't, just simply could not happen because Pierre-Luc Dubois is on a one-year deal and all he has to do to guarantee that he's a free agent, to free to sign with anyone in 2024, is file for arbitration next summer. And that's easy to do. Um, you know, that's something well within his rights and, and, and could be done. So now all of a sudden you don't have certainty on center. You can't make a transformative move that involves Shifley. We're, we're fairly confident. I'm fairly confident that Winnipeg pursued a Blake Wheeler trade, especially in and around the draft, and then found that he did not have value in the way that you would hope that he would, given his stature and his contributions to the team and his offense over the years. But, you know, you look around the NHL with the cap situation being what it is. I know Vegas was sort of under a barrel a little bit. Um, they needed to get cap compliant, but they traded Max Pacioretty, a younger, uh, better goal scorer with less term left on his contract and less money left on his contract too, got future considerations in return. And imagine Winnipeg, trading the captain for the last several years in a, a day one Winnipeg jet for nothing. Like, I just don't think that that's a thing that can happen. So even if they were open to a mutual parting of ways, and you know, we learned the jets, I think that it just didn't shake out in that particular direction. And now it's about, well, Hey, did, you know, I've been gone for a while, but did Wheeler return bonuses text? Did, you know, did he, <laughs> did they ever have that phone call that they were talking about way back when bones got hired? And you know, what's that, been like and what have the plans been uh, in terms of what Wheeler's role is going to be and all those sorts of things and that's not even getting to the defense the defense is the one that I honestly don't understand because I can I can see roadblock to transformative change up front especially if if you put aside all the cynicism and you just want to be an optimist I mean these are good hockey players we're talking about Wheeler, Shifley, Dubois why wouldn't you want to take one more look at them, especially that Shifley Dubois combination down the middle, and say, hey, well, we acquired these guys for a reason. We believe they complement each other really well. Those are two very good centers. Maybe we can make the playoffs with these guys and see what we can accomplish there. So I can see that. On defense, I don't know exactly what's happening there because not only do they not clear a veteran uh, to make room for, you know, Ville Hanel or Dylan Sandberg or name your prospect defenseman of choice, but they add Kyle Capo Bianco. Um, who is a veteran who would require waivers to be um, to be sent down to the AHL if need be. Jonathan Kovacevic loses his waivers exemption, and I think he's a perfect seventh defenseman, six seven defenseman. He's right-handed, big, versatile, um, positive attitude. I think that oftentimes you like a veteran to be a, a number seven guy, but he has all of those sorts of elements about him as a person where you'd imagine a seventh D-man job would be open to him. And then you have all these veterans in front as well. And it just, it would seem strange to me if Villa Hainel and Dylan Sandberg have the training camps of their lives and get sent back to the Moose and uh, and go back there. The Moose added minor league defensemen as well. So there's a bit of a logjam that yet persists. I don't see that logjam being blown wide open, but that's the one I just, what have the offers been like? You know, what have the calls been like? Um, and why are the Jets responding in the way that they are? Maybe, maybe they just don't want to waste... Hmm capable players for for nothing or maybe there's a different strategy at, at hand that i that i can't figure out or they they believe they have to go all veterans for a shot at the playoffs or or what have you that's the one that that we're still waiting on i think yeah you know the i mean the log gem on the blue line is fascinating it has been something that you know we've talked about really since the end of last season looking ahead to the fact that you know you'd like to see billy hanel get a legitimate shot dylan sambry showed that he is ready to go and you mentioned Johnny Kovacevic, who's been a great part of this organization, has some NHL potential, and you would risk losing for nothing. I mean, the only thing I can imagine right now, and I guess maybe we read the tea leaves a little bit, Dmitry Kulikov got traded for good old future considerations, essentially take him for nothing. Um, I still find it hard to believe that that would have been the asking, or that would have been the market for some of the Winnipeg Jet defensemen that potentially could have been on the move. Um, but I guess there is something to be said for sticking to your guns and believing in the value of the players that you have and keeping them. But that doesn't solve your problems because the problems are still there. And I'll, I'll tell you this, Murad. I mean, you just mentioned a scenario where Vili Hanel and Dylan Sandberg have great camps and are back with the Manitoba Moose. 
I really do. I, I, that concerns me for a number of reasons, but especially for a team that at some point is going to have to lean on these young guys and will be going in that direction. I mean, if this happens again with those guys, especially Vili Hanela, you do wonder whether that erodes confidence of his future within this organization going forward. And all of a sudden you've got a disgruntled player looking to leave before they even have a chance to show what they can do consistently at the next level. Yeah, that's exactly the concern. And with Sandberg, you can make the argument that, okay, he's older. Um, he had his college career, um, but this would only be a second season with the Manitoba Moose. You can make the argument that, you know, there's still something to learn at that level. And certainly he wasn't a perfect Manitoba Moose defenseman last season, but he was very good. And he looked very good in his NHL stint as well. So, you know, you can you can write that one off to, okay, he's on track. He's going to be good. You know, even, he, even no matter what you believe about aging curves, and many people believe early 20s is a completely fine age for defensemen to make that transition now where it used to be, okay, wait till they're 25, wait till they're 30 or what have you. Um, with him, though, you, you can imagine one more year, that's not fine exactly, but okay, nobody's going to be up in arms. Billy Hanel has been through the ringer, and he made an NHL team, the Winnipeg Jets, Maybe before he was ready, you know, he was moving the puck really well. Um, that was a, you know, an injury depleted team. That was a team in in dire straits. Goes to the AHL. There's the 2020 season or 2021 season. Pardon me. Um, with the bubble situ, with the taxi squad situation. Pardon me. Where he goes a month without playing an AHL or NHL game, um, and. That could not possibly have been good for his development and would have been a challenge uh, for him personally as well. And then this most recent year is the first year you can make the argument, well, hey, they actually got a whole bunch of veterans. It makes a little bit of sense that he would play in Manitoba and wait for his opportunity, get his opportunity and seize it. And he's, he's just seen so many different versions of him not sticking to the NHL with the Winnipeg Jets. And, you know, by all accounts, his attitude is still positive. You'll notice he's... Um, I believe he's in the pictures that the Jets released of those casual, you know, captain skates, as they call it. The Jets put out some pictures of it this most recent weekend. Mm -hmm. I think he's doing everything to prove to everybody. He's not checking out. He's do he's doing everything he can to to serve his career and do everything to make that NHL job. But he could still get squeezed out. And how many years can that happen to a player before he believes that he's not part of the the vision anymore? And that's not woe is Ville, woe is Ville. At the same time, Maybe that's a legitimate indication on the Winnipeg Jets part that they haven't viewed him as um, as a solution going forward as well. And maybe they view the size and they view the, you know, the portions of his game where he's going to need to de defend in his own zone as well as a concern in a way that maybe people who watch the AHL um, are less concerned about because he's quietly effective there. Yeah, um, but I think one way or the other, I mean, you would understand if you were in that position, maybe taking it that way after happening again. All that being said, we're talking about something that is possible to happen in four weeks or five weeks. Um, I have to think that, you know, Cheval Dayoff is, I mean, I can guarantee you he's probably had a million phone calls throughout the summer talking about these sort of options and I would imagine that there'd be a number of general managers that have a pretty, pretty good idea or framework of where their counterparts are at, what they're willing to pay for a certain asset. Uh, but there may be an element of wait and see, not just on the Winnipeg Jets, but a number of other teams as to how things go in training camp, how some young players look. And maybe this is a, a strange situation where you're almost on a trade watch throughout training camp and the preseason as to what makes the most sense. The one thing that I can tell you that I don't think many people would disagree with, that with the cap space the Winnipeg Jets have, whether you're doing it money in, money out, or whether you're taking in a little bit more money back because the Jets can do it right now, it would behoove the club and make a lot of sense to move out one of those veteran defensemen if you could turn that into another forward that can make an impact, potentially play in the middle six, maybe take a little bit of the load off Cole Perfetti, who right now on paper is going to have a lot on his shoulders. That would be a good thing for the home team. Yeah, I would agree with that. If you could snap your fingers and move one of the veteran defensemen for, you know, a middle six or a third line type forward or what have you. That's why I think that, you know, the rumor mill, not not necessarily from media, but from like fans who are just looking for, you know, intelligent fits tends to fire up every time you hear about the Oilers trading Yessi Puyuyarvi. There's a certain amount of, well, hey, you know, 
the Oilers need a defenseman, maybe, you know, Brendan Dillon or whomever for, for Puyu Yarvi. And those types of trades, if they exist, do make some sense to me. I'd imagine that you're exactly right, that there are teams that are waiting to see how camp goes a little bit um, before assessing their defense situation. Um, but at the same time, like, I don't think, you know, if the Jets have a Nate Schmidt's 6 million or 5.59 million contract for a fourth round draft pick trade in the hopper, you know, I, I don't know. I feel like the Jets might just hold on to that type of type of player and, you know, take the cushion against injury. I do think, though, that um, more than more than any year that I can remember, there's a sense of like, what exactly are is the plan? And maybe it's just that they had prices in their mind for these players that weren't met and they're holding on to them and they acknowledge that their prospects may not get all the minutes that they want, but um, that they're just unwilling to lose them at, at that substantial loss or um, not getting calls for Schmidt. And then they're getting calls for Brendan Dillon that, don't meet their expectations or Dylan DeMello that don't meet their expectations. Um, they don't have to move these guys just to do it. Um, like you say, they're under the cap and yes, it's an imbalanced team in some ways, uh, but there's no cap emergency. If you're Kevin shovel day off and you want to wait and see, and he has a long history of being very good at waiting and seeing, um, you know, I think that you don't have that, that like, I guess, pressure point to make a move on those guys in, Winnipeg Sports Talk, we're in conversation with Murata Tesh of The Athletic. If you're enjoying the interview, make sure you hit the thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. It's completely free. Hit that red button and join us daily here at 1 o'clock p.m. Central Time. So, Murat, you brought up Jesse Pugliarvi. I was thinking about this this morning. Um, a lot of talk in Edmonton. And, you know, you had mentioned maybe moving him for more of a defense, a defensive or a veteran defenseman, I should say. With that comes salary. And I think part of the reason why Edmonton needs to trade Jesse Pugliarvi is to save a little bit of the cap. Yes, he pulled the RV to the Jets for Logan Stanley and maybe a mid-round pick. Who says no? Oh, wow. Oh, um, I think Winnipeg says no because the Jets have some folks still dug in on Logan Stanley's future and potential, or at least that's my understanding of it. Um, but I think that's the type of trade you're looking at. If, if you believe, as I believe, that Logan Stanley's future is that over the next few years, he'll probably develop into a player who might be able to play a top four role, but that's not a guarantee. You know, I see Jamie Oleksiak as a ceiling for this player. Um, that's somebody that you may be willing to part with for more, well, I mean, for help in places where you need it a little bit more, especially given what else is going on in the roster. But I think that there are some folks who, despite, you know, a difficult year for him last year, look at how well he did in a more sheltered role the year before and wonder if there's something there to it. So you've got me on the edge where I'm thinking to myself, well, I'd probably make that trade, but hold on, let me think. And if I'm there, I don't think the Jets are there. And I'm sure the fan base is divided. So I look forward to all the comments being like, Murat, you're either like hilariously wrong for not saying yes immediately or hilariously wrong for even considering it at all. Cause I know that Logan Stanley is a divisive player. Well, I, no, but I think you make a really good point and I think you're absolutely true. I mean, th there's obvious this organization's put a lot into Logan Stanley and this goes back to our conversations last year as to why we thought, uh, I thought that this guy was going to be protected because he has been a cornerstone. The fact of the matter is he didn't have a great season last year and the circumstances are different now. Dylan Sandberg's here. Billy Hanel is seemingly ready. You still have all these defensemen. And if the veteran defensemen are the ones that are difficult to move and you've got these young guys pushing in, somebody's the odd guy out. And if Logan Stanley is going to be a 6-7 defenseman or potentially in the press box, if you've got Sandberg or Billy Hanel playing ahead of them, which I would say is a possibility, especially with a new head coach, to me, that's something that I would look at. I mean, it's no different from Edmonton. I don't think they really want to trade Jesse Pugliarvi, but situations are, um, you know, essentially dictating that they have to make some sort of a move. And I was kicking that one around this morning. And, you know, in some ways, based on the criteria, you improve it forward, you use some defense capital, 
you shift some of that salary cap disp dispersal to the forward group for a young player that has potential that if it goes well, could potentially stay here for a long time. I think you can say that for both players. And, you know, to me, it's a, it is at least something interesting to kick around on the show and talk about because that is the sort of trade that I think does make sense. Hey, if you could move one of the more expensive defensemen and get a more high end player, I mean, go for it. But I don't think that's been there so far. I think if it was, it probably would have happened already. 100%. If it was there, I, I believe that it would have happened as well. Like, I don't, I don't think, but that Winnipeg's looking at, you know, okay, you added Brendan Dillon and Nate Schmidt, and you had the season that you just had. It was underwhelming. But since you added those guys, you have Morrissey, you have Pionk, you have Dylan DeMello, Stanley. Like, I don't know that they're looking at what just happened and thinking, this is the answer. We're going to make the playoffs absolutely with these guys, um, especially considering what just happened a year ago. And the cap hits and ages of some of these players, it, it, it's a little bit inefficient. At the same time, like another hypothetical, what if these Jets struggle badly? What if these Jets hit the trade deadline out of the playoff picture once again? At that point, are they not behooved to at least explore the idea of moving Schmidt, moving Dylan, moving DeMello, moving whomever? And is there a chance that by spring of this time, Logan Stanley's looking around and being like, wow, yeah, there, there used to be a whole bunch of people with more experience than me on this team. And now it's just Josh Morrissey and Neil Pionk and maybe one other player, like depending on what happens this year. I don't think that's the play. I don't think that's what Winnipeg is doing. But if this very clear bubble area team that might make the playoffs that, you know, probably I think odds makers would say probably won't um, without quite a lot of improvement. You know, if they're out of the picture, then maybe they finally do move uh, some of the veterans at the trade deadline. And now all of a sudden, Stanley is a more important player to the team than he was today, which, you know, right now, if you're looking at those guys, he's maybe a little more expendable. Well, I mean, listen, under that scenario, and I, I kind of believe almost you know, before the trade deadline, we're going to know one way or the other. I mean, which way this team is going. Um, you know, if in the first 25 to 30 games, the team isn't improved and they're looking like it's going to be a real uphill battle, um, you, you know, you maybe start having those c conversations about the defense, but that's going to be secondary when we're talking because, you know, once you get around to that trade deadline, it's not going to be about defense and with two more years on the deal. It's going to be about Shifley. It's going to be about Pierre-Luc Dubois. I mean, those are the guys that have two years left of team control. If you trade them this season, if you believe it's in your best interest to do that, you're trading and getting value for a player that will have two playoff runs in wherever they go. Um, and as I said, I hopefully we're not talking about that. Hopefully we're talking about maybe an ad at the playoffs at the uh, trade deadline and this team being playoffs. But I think we, I mean, there's so much uncertainty about what this team is after last year. Um, it, it will certainly be part of the conversation. And I think that, you know, every game early on in the season, will be important to kind of see what this team is capable of and what that does to Kevin Sheveldayoff's position when it comes to adding or subtracting from the current roster. But we've got to talk about the captain for a second, Murat, because you did mention, I mean, it is believed by many that the team and the player were open to moving on. It hasn't happened. Um, there's been so much talk about the uh, the leadership group overall, maybe some time, uh, it was time at the end of last year to see that maybe move on. Uh, what do you make of Blake Wheeler's situation coming in? Uh, we haven't heard from him yet. I'll be fascinated to see here, much like we heard from Mark Shifley when sitting down with Sarah. I'm not sure what the environment we, whether it will be with Sarah, whether it will be with the uh, the uh, assembled Winnipeg media first. But um, thoughts on Wheeler's situation and how it's very different this year than it maybe has been as the face of the franchise for the better part of the last half decade plus. Yeah, I mean... I think that his stature within the team is, you know, well known, well discussed. The idea of him being traded in any moment before this probably would have been met with ridicule. And then, you know, in the summer, you sort of had the sense that this was something that Winnipeg was poking around about and that Blake Wheeler would have been amenable to. Um, it would probably be, you know, assuming that what we all believe is in fact the truth, and I think that it is, like it would probably be a bit of a gut punch to think, well, wow, at this stage of my career at this stage of salary, um, future considerations or what have you, or the need to eat money is is what's out there. I, I don't know that that's how Blake Wheeler would think. Maybe, maybe not, but I think that there would be a bit of a gut punch in that. Um, I think that all of this consternation about the leadership group, especially with Paul Stastny signing in Carolina, 
you know, there's a chance that Blake Wheeler finds himself on a bit of an island as a, you know, as a holdover veteran from, uh, you know, who's been in the league a lot longer than everybody else that might not be as comfortable in this, in this situation as uh, in past years. Um, at the same time, he's still a Winnipeg Jet and, you know, he still has the captaincy. And even if Rick Bonus does something wild and crazy, like, hey, we're not going to have a captain for a while. We're going to see who the leader is or, or something to that effect. He's new. He can get away with that sort of stuff. You know, he'd still be in that mix. And he hasn't said anything that he can't take back. His exit season interview was cordial. Nobody's gone on any record saying anything at all. So it would be so easy if I'm writing the PR to say, hey, look, you know, I don't make the roster decisions. You know, that's above my pay grade. I just play hockey. Um, you guys talked about that, but all I'm focused on is, you know, winning with the Winnipeg Jets right now. I love these guys. I've been here since day one. Bam. End of story. Like there's nothing, you know, there's nothing that they have to bring to the foreground, even though I think it's pretty clear that they were exploring, you know, a parting of ways this summer that didn't come to fruition. And that's an awkward spot. Like publicly, that's an easy PR move to me. But privately, that's an awkward spot for a person to be in, a foundational piece of the team for so long, a veteran, somebody who's maybe losing um, that veteran surroundings in that dressing room as well. And then, of course, he has to deal with, you know, what any human being would be dealing with is, you know, he's watched himself go from an NHL elite to kind of a middle six player. And that slide's going to continue because time gets everybody. There's going to be a lot of a lot of difficult situations facing Blake Wheeler, I think, in the next little while. Well, to me, it goes one of three ways. I mean, one, they just simply run it back. He's the captain. We're doing this all over again. That's number one. Two was what you brought up. New head coach, new um, new method of determining leadership, and, and maybe it's just a matter of taking the time to have that changeover, uh, but maybe there isn't a captain. There's a bigger leadership group, and you're bringing some other guys in. The other possibility that I don't discount, because I think there's probably been a lot of soul searching by Blake Wheeler over the course of the last little while, especially when it seemed apparent that he wasn't going to be moving on, um, that maybe he proactively steps away from the captaincy thinking it might be a good thing for the team. Um, so there's that side of things. And then the other bit is that if, listen, Blake's a very proud guy and Listen, I still think that he's played at a very high level. I mean, even last year, I mean, from the knocks that he got earlier on in the season, I mean, you look at what he was able to do by the end of the season, and that's still very productive. It might not be eight and a quarter million productive, but it's still productive. So, I mean, he comes in, everyone's doubting me, playing with a bit of a chip on his shoulder. Uh, the one thing I can tell you is if everyone thinking that he's going to be a bottom six player for the Winnipeg Jets, that ain't happening until there's a bunch of players that are better than Blake Wheeler to take that spot. And when I look at this roster, that's not the case, Murat. Well, yeah, that's, that's a fact. I see him as a second line right winger, possibly third, depending on who's going. But a bottom six player, he is not. His even strength production is still in that middle six range. He's a tremendous playmaker on the power play and operates with a consistency that you can count on a certain level of points. And the one thing that I like, and you, I'm like always fascinated by how these guys extend their careers or find ways, because often you find with the very best, they're good sooner. So they make the league at 18, 19, 20, whatever it is, and they find ways to be helpful later into their careers. And you could use Paul Stastny as an example of that. Um, you know, he's had such a great career and he was great early and he's still helping teams in, in a quite a quite a big way right now. Blake Wheeler, when he came back from that injury, kind of added a new pitch to his game um, in terms of how he transitioned the puck through the neutral zone across that blue line and the reads he was making off of defensemen. And he was slowing the game down, whereas young Blake Wheeler would turn corners on people, would bulldog his way to the net, would be kind of unstoppable in that way. He doesn't have that skill set right now. What he does have is that vision that is still an NHL elite playmaker's vision and the hands to execute plays. So I think it was, was it Kevin Shattenkirk at one point where Wheeler made the read as he's crossing the blue line that Shattenkirk is going to shift lanes and he just holds onto the puck one second later, cuts in and around him and burns him. That was a really heady play and it led to a goal, but it wasn't the only version of that play. Wheeler was slowing things down, taking the puck into the middle of the ice and holding it there, waiting for things to break apart. And I asked him about that in the spring and he said, yeah, you know what? Um, I, I was talking to Adam Oates while I was hurt and I realized I needed to complete, like not completely, pardon me, continue, continue to work on my game and add new things to my game. And that was one of those things. And that, I think that is the sort of thing you're looking for, for like, hey, is this veteran player aging? I think he just had his birthday on August 31st. Is he still going to find ways to help? 
And when they approach games as a problem solving situation like that, I like it. I like that from Blake Wheeler. I still think that he's a good bet to score a middle six, second line type of point production this year. Uh, Marat, before we go, uh, what did you think of what Mark Shifley had to say when he sat down with uh, Sarah? I know you talked about it. Um, and listen, I agree with you. I mean, when you're Sarah's in a very is a new role, she's working for the team. Um, there was a large element of PR to it, but um, getting aside all of that, he certainly seemed to be in good spirits, seemed to be focused, and I think that was the most important thing coming out of that. That it's, it was a very different sounding Mark Shifley than the last time we'd heard him speak at the end of last season. Yeah, absolutely. And it's it's interesting. Those end of season comments that he made were were not taken out of context. You know what I mean? Like, no, it was all I, the media, I, man. <laughs> it was all the media. It was a media disaster to quote him. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, I mean, my first impression is this, uh, in, like kind of in order of how I watched that interview. You know, Sarah asked the question. She asked, you know, hey, the last time that we spoke, I didn't think necessary. I didn't know. I didn't. I wasn't sure you'd be back based on that. Like, what did you think about that? And like, if it was pure puff, if it was pure, like we're just we're all on the same team now. You might not even ask that question. And I think that it was important, extremely important for fans to have an answer to that to that question. Is like, well, hey, like, what of that now? To Sarah's PR credit, that's the way it started off, too. I mean, there was no waiting for anything. It was, let's get right to it. Hey, you're back. Uh <laughs> exactly right. I think that's a terrific way to do it. I think that was a great job. Um, but also, it is, you know, in a team-controlled environment. Sarah is somebody who is loved by everybody. Like, media, we all get along with her so she's a wonderful human being the players feel comfortable around her um they're you know sitting on chairs outdoors is a comfortable scenario the team's going to edit this video however way they need to so mark gets to be a very comfortable version of himself in that situation knowing that he's going to get to speak his piece and that's what the pr pr element comes from it they can say they address the issue and now he he goes to the well of like Hey, I started my answer to that question by saying I loved Winnipeg. It's all I ever know. I value the community. That is true. He did say those things. And then he says, it's as if everybody started recording after that. And then it became a media disaster. And I, I was too honest. And that's the part that, you know, I'm like, okay, we've been to this well with Mark Shifley before where, you know, coming out of the Jake Evans situation, coming out of the Matthew Kachuk situation, coming out of... Um, you know, after that sweep over the Oilers, Mark Shifley has said, has sort of blamed the media for things a few times. There's been an us against the world attitude a few times. And he's talking about not being quoted in full. Well, I mean, I can't speak for every media outlet. I went back and read what I wrote the day that he said those things. And I included every word of that answer, including the love, including all that stuff about Winnipeg. And I think to myself, well, I actually think that was a fair way to approach the situation. And it's also completely fair, in my opinion, to expect that if you're under contract for two years and any part of your answer at all expresses some concern about your future with the team, then I think everybody in that fan base, everybody in that market has the right to talk about that. That's the story. <laughs> That's exactly the story. And it's a it's an enormous part of not only what he said in the moment, it's an enormous, enormous potential story for the market, for the fan base, for the direction of the entire franchise, because he's that important of a player. And there is a maybe to his to the vibe about his return. And I get that a player could be tremendously frustrated with the year that just happened. And I get that even in the context of that answer, um, he shows love for Winnipeg and all of those sorts of things. But if it was just a moment of frustration and it was just like a sense of like, hey, I really need to have hard conversations with Kevin Shevelday and all those sorts of things, then maybe in the PR interview in August, you say something like, hey, I was heated in that moment. Of course, I love it here. And he I, like, of course, I love it here. I was just emotional at that time. And you just leave it at that because he did acknowledge he was emotional at that time. But to say that it was somehow like a surprise that this became a big deal to the people who cheer for him or who who like cover that team is, I don't know. I didn't like that. But at the same time, I mean, gosh, like what a positive interview, what a what a, like a cheerful disposition he was in, optimistic about the future ahead. And for all of, you know, my nitpicking about how to approach the PR of this situation, he's still an important 
of that team. Um, and I think that there's many people within the Jets organization who still really believe in him as a person. He's, you know, he's a well-liked guy in a lot of ways. Um, it's just, it's just, I guess you have to read what I wrote because I'm more articulate, uh, you know, in writing than out loud. It, there's a lot of different angles to look at that from. And mine is, you know, impressed by the PR and a little bit cynical about it as well. Well, you know what? I mean, you know me. I mean, I want this team to do well. I, 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 I the first thing that I, I, I took away from it was that I was, I was happy and I was personally excited that he sounded like the old Mark Shifley. And, you know, hopefully that's the guy we get in training camp and getting this season. The one thing that I had a tough time sort of making sense of was the one thing that we had at the end of his argue at the end of his interview before was that I'm going to need to have some conversations about the direction of the team. And as far as I can tell, we have no idea what the direction of the team, how it's changed from the end of last season, other than we've got Rick Bonus on the bench, and that'll be certainly fascinating to see. But uh, certainly he's going to give us lots to talk about as we get into training camp, the preseason, and uh, of course we'll be focusing in on the prospects right now. Marat, we went a little long, but thanks so much. We've missed you. Everyone here missed you, and uh, can't wait to do this on the reg as we get into training camp next week and uh, with you throughout the season. Hey, thanks so much. Excuse my preseason forum, but we'll be fired up on coffee and all the things. And then, and, and I just, I can't wait to, to be doing this once a week with you again. Yeah. I'm all on board for it. Thank you. Enjoy the action on the weekend, pal. Thanks for doing this. All right. Awesome stuff with our good friend, Marat Atesh. Hit that like button folks. If you're enjoying the program and Marat's return and make sure you're subscribed to the channel, red subscribe button, free, easy, and the freshest WST content to you daily like our visits every week with Marat Atesh. All right, um, we've got some news, well, somewhat news to talk about. It's the first time we've had lines or anything to get to. We'll get to that in just a second. And Jackson Jeffco to the Winnipeg Blue Bombers in just a few minutes as well here on Winnipeg Sports Talk. Uh, we do want to thank Princess Auto for all their great support of Winnipeg Sports Talk. And a big congratulations to Team Jennifer Jones. Um, man, I had so much fun sitting down with Jen and uh, and Mackenzie Zacharias out of Princess Auto a couple weeks ago, and uh, they won the Seville Shootout, second tourney of the year there in the win uh, column, beating the Homan Rink in the finals. So a great start for them. I know the gang at Princess very excited about that. Of course, Princess Auto is where you'll find the best deals on the most unique assortment of tools and equipment around. Everything you need to complete the projects on your list or start something new is at Princess Auto. Two Winnipeg locations, Panet Road, Portage Avenue West, or shop online 24-7, 365. And don't forget the Princess Auto tailgate zone before Bombers Riders coming up on September 30th. Um, our friends at Culligan Water... You know, normally we have fun with Ken when he comes on, Kenny Weeb at Weeb's World, because Ken is the most well-hydrated member of the Winnipeg media, but uh, we should all be as hydrated as Ken, uh, and mm, heck of a lot easier to do that with the great products and services from the experts at Culligan Water, celebrating over 65 years in business as the go-to folks for all things water here in Winnipeg for your home, your cottage, or your business. Water softeners, filters, bottled water coolers, whole home systems, drinking water systems, and citywide water delivery services, as well as commercial and industrial water products and solutions. Get at them uh, on the Hornet 694 5180. Pop them, pop by and give them a visit at 1200 Sergeant Avenue or find out everything they can do for you and your family online at drinkculligan.com. Uh, and a big cheers to our friends at Canadian Club. I always joke about the uh, the CC and C, the uh, Ryan Water, the Canadian Club, and Culligan. Uh, well, if you uh, do want a little bit of pop in with it, the uh, drink of the summer, the world famous Canadian Club and ginger ale. And no, you don't need to buy bottles and mix because it's already done for you, ready to drink at your local beer store in six packs. It's the new Canadian Club and ginger ale. And I uh, saw. A ton of people enjoying a few of those at the Banjo Bowl on the weekend. Of course, Canadian club products available throughout IG Field as Canadian Club is the official sponsor of the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. Um, and just before we get to a little bit of a jet update, um, we haven't talked a lot of football today. We will talk some football with Jackson Jeffcote tomorrow. Thursday night football gets going uh, and Boston Pizza 
all season long is your NFL headquarters. Watch every NFL games on the big screens at BP. Enjoy delicious BP pizza flights and ice cold by draft on special for five bucks every game. Spin the BP prize wheel for great prizes like Boston Bucks pizza flights and more. And enter to win one of two grand prize trips for two for an NFL weekend in Vegas, including airfare, hotel, NFL game tickets, and a bonus NHL game. Right now, people are entering for the first trip, November long weekend, 11th to 13th, Raiders, Colts, Golden Knights, and Blues. And the second trip will be over New Year's Eve, the Raiders and 49ers. And the Golden Knights hosting the Predators on New Year's Eve as well. Watch the NFL and win and enter to win at any Winnipeg, Selkirk, Steinbach, Morton, and Portage, Boston Pizza location. All right, Jackson Jeffcoat's coming up right away. Uh, but, Reem, let's get to uh, this news. This first Jets news. We have our first line rushes of the year. And uh, I haven't heard you this excited in a long time. I can't speak, Huff. I can't speak. I'm like frothing at the mouth. I can't be on camera right now. There's just like drool. I'm salivating. Get the it idea together. <laughs> of li line rushes. Oh my god. Uh, I, I'm like can't even type. I'm shaking here, looking at the line rushes for the first time. Uh, shout out to Mike who's got him, uh, and what? Who else has him? Uh, Mitch Clinton too. So here the we're thirsty, really thirsty for some line combos. Like haven't had this. When the last time we had line combos, I'm like. Sorry, I can't. The heart rate is just uh, too well, fast. Well, the thing here. that pops out to me is something that we talked about yesterday. Maybe seeing a little Chaz Lucius and Brad Lambert together. And uh, they are on line number two. No surprise at all The Cole Perfetti is uh, on the top line. But he is playing in the middle. I think certainly he sort of projects more on the wing at the national hockey level, at least this year. Uh, but Torgerson and uh, last year's uh, Moose standout, Greg Morellis, at the at the top of the list, um, and uh, Henry Nikitin playing in the middle, uh, Dimitri Zhilkin as well, and um, obviously uh, you can see I, I know Jamie did mention Tyrell Bauer was in the non-contact jersey, but still participating as one of eight defensemen that'll be making the trip. Uh, I guess scheduled right now to make the trip to Penticton. Yeah, we also mentioned Dimitri Kuzman. I mentioned him yesterday. Guy I want to watch. He's top D with uh, Simon Lundmark there. So. Uh, there you go. Jets, Lammers. Do you want to see practice? We got practice video. Scott Billick was so nice and recorded some drills. Like, ho hockey season is, we're here. Like, it's. Yeah, it's I guess play it, even though this is a podcast for many people and they're not enjoying the show with the wonders of the video well, technology the and your incredible production skills. Um, it is probably worthwhile because we've got a ton of people here that are ready to see it. And, any glimpse of live bodies with pulses wearing NHL jerseys right now, even if it's prospects camp before the young stars, will qualify as breaking news right now after the summer that we've had in the last slow couple months for uh, us following the Winnipeg Jets. Yeah, and also, I mean, the Jets don't have a play-by-play -play guy, if, you know, for the people on the podcast, if you want to take an uh, audition. Sure. Because sure. that's, that's the I, number one. that's the I, number one question every day. Who's... Who's the play-by-play -play guy? As I say, they just don't take Marble Race play-by-play -play seriously. And yeah. that apparently is why I haven't gotten proper consideration for the gig. Uh, but here you go. We've got the young stars out on the ice. Cole Perfetti in white, number one, dealing in and around the net. Nice spin move behind. And uh, he puts it out to uh, the, uh, the defenseman in blue. Again, we've got limited <laughs> video and limited numbers right now, but... That, that was, was Cole Perfetti. That was our first little bit of play-by-play -play for you. And folks, uh, again, that's that from was Scott good, Billick. So if you're listening on the podcast, there'll be plenty of content out there of clips from what's going on. And I want to give a shout out to my pal Riley, Mr. Spills, who is now out in the Kelowna area. He's going to be taking in at least one or two of the games and um, it's going to fire some photos back to us, which we'll have for you on Winnipeg Sports Talk over the uh, next little bit. All right. Um, <laughs> Hey, uh, let's uh, get to Jackson Jeffcoat. I know there's a lot of folks that are that are big fans of Jackson, huge fans of the Bombers, and um, he's just one of the most uh, nice, quiet, which is funny for a monster defensive end we see on the football field. Uh, he's also a dog owner, and I'll give you a little tease. I caught up with Jackson after yesterday's show, and uh, 
There may or may not be a dog appearance at the end of the program. So uh, let's get to it. Jackson Jeffco to the Winnipeg Blue Bombers as they get ready for the Ticats on the road Saturday afternoon after sweeping the Labor Day Classic in the Banjo Bowl against the Riders. Jackson, thanks so much for doing this. It's great to have you on the show again. Good to be back on. Good to be back on. I'm excited to chat with you. How you uh, how you feeling after that big win on Saturday? I'm feeling good. Uh, you know how they say 24 hour rule. So now on the Hamilton, and uh, I'm excited about them. I like the, playing in Hamilton. Well, a- absolutely. I mean, uh, uh, we do have to quickly talk about these last couple of games against the Riders. I mean, two very different games. Uh, uh, and, and you know, maybe go back to the Labor Day Classic from a defensive perspective. That was not the way I'm sure you guys wanted to to start. I mean, a touchdown right off the bat, and uh, you know you held in and held them to a couple field goals in key points to not get too far behind, and then everything switched up in the second quarter, and then the second half was sort of that bomber defense we've been become so accustomed to, allowing only one point. When you look back at that game on the road, how did you think you and your particularly the defensive group sort of evolved through the game to help you guys get the win? I think we just started figuring out what they were trying to do. Uh, that was the biggest thing. We looked at the film we were watching. Uh, we Okay, they're just trying to run this and decided, uh, like, we're not going to let them get what they want to do, with what they want to get. We're going to make sure that we stop them and impose our will on them as a defense. How um, Do you guys look at film at halftime? Like, you know, when well, something like that happens, like, is there, iPad. what happens? We have an iPad that you're able to look at some of the plays uh, from a from a far view. So you watch the plays and see what what teams are doing. Coach will come in at halftime and talk to us, try to make adjustments and whatnot. At and, a certain point, I imagine it's a lot of execution. I mean, especially when you're going back to back against a team. I mean, you know, there are probably some things you could do better. And uh, the one thing that this defense consistently does is exactly that when you need it. And I mean, it was a really strong half of football in Regina, um, you know, against a team and a a quarterback that was playing quite well. And yet only one point on the board in the second half. For sure. For sure. Yeah. It's a, I think it's like you said, it's a lot of execution. We got to make sure that we, we stick to our X's and O's and do what Richie, what, what his game plan. I mean, that's important. Richie calls a good game and we just have to execute. Hey, you know, we talk so much uh, and deservedly so about Mike O'Shea, everything that he's created with this team, the the the, the identity of the Winnipeg Blue Bombers as a team. Uh, but you mentioned Richie Hall. He's been here for a while and has been a huge part. Um, well, what do people maybe would they like to know about Richie Hall and how important he has been to the success of the Bombers defense in your mind, Jackson? Well, Rich is just, uh, he's extremely smart. He's played the game. He's been in the shoes of where our DBs have been, so he kind of understands just what it takes to to be successful in that in that realm. And also, he's gotten brought in good coaches: uh, James Stanley, Jordan Younger, uh, Dale Patterson, guys that have also played football as well and know the game and are able to coach and teach um, and show us what needs to be done. So, yeah. But Rich is great. He's just smart. Like he just knows like he just knows what to call at the right time. Perfect. You know, we had uh we had Nick Dembski on the show last week and he was sort of lamenting, you know, these back to back games where he said, Ah, oh, you know, you can only watch so much film, you know, of the same team going back and forth. But he also said it was somewhat of a maybe a simpler practice week going up against a team in the second end of back to backs. Uh, all that being said, you guys knew the, what the job was going into Saturday. And, uh, man, that was a full team performance all around, uh, putting up 50 and uh, having a big game on the defensive side of the football. I mean, uh, been around here for a while. I, I got to tell you, from a, from a fan standpoint, the atmosphere in that game before the game during was, I think, is as good as it's ever been. Um, what was it like being a part of that on the field, having everything go your way pretty much from the first drive? It was a lot of fun. I mean, you uh, people talk about Sass being sick and whatnot, and uh, we've been there before. And the Great Cup in 2019, a lot of us were sick, myself included. We're not feeling well. We were under the weather. Had to come and play. 
like not feeling well. And so I understand how they, they might have felt, but like at the end of the day, it's your job. You gotta get it done. And we're not gonna feel sorry for anybody when there's things going on. I mean, no one feels sorry for us. So uh we just made sure that we got we handled and executed uh and played the way we knew we can play, especially in front of our fans. We got the best fans in the CFL. Well, I mean, came out. well, I mean, just from your perspective, you've been here for a while. I mean, that scene, the vibe, the atmosphere, um, as I said, was as good as I can remember. What was it like to be on that field? How did it feel to come out in the tunnel, see all that blue, and um, and experience the banjo bowl and put an emphatic W on the board for uh, the fans to go home happy and continue their weekend? It's just incredible. It's incredible to play in front of our fans. It's incredible to have that atmosphere that, that, as loud as it gets. Um, I don't know. I love playing at home. I uh, it's a it's a special place for me. Even coming from the University of Texas and playing in front of one hundred and one thousand. I mean, IG Field is up there with them. Well, I mean, I don't think there's any doubt. I was saying on Monday, I mean, as as great as it was to see the NFL back, uh, I don't. I, I think I would feel confident putting up the atmosphere in and around IG Field on Saturday afternoon against just about any of the games that was played in the four down game this weekend. And uh, listen, it was it was fun to be, and a big part of that is obviously what the fans are bringing, but also what you and your teammates do week after week after week. But I wanted to ask you about that. I've thought for a long time that there's a special connection between this team and the fan base, and it's really grown. And it started before the team even won the 2019 Grey Cup. Now that you've been here for a while, um, do you feel that same way about a real connection? I mean, we saw it after the game with so many players sticking around to greet fans on the field. And, of course, a great turnout for fan appreciation. And, and it really does seem like your team, more than any other team I've been around, look forward to those op- uh, opportunities to interact with fans and sort of make their day, considering the support they're giving you guys when you're on the field. Yeah, I've said it many times. It's just something special with the fans. I mean, even when we... We didn't know how many fans we were going to have uh, in the COVID year. And just having people come out and still show us love and still hit us up, telling us, like, man, you guys are doing great. Even when we weren't, even when we lost, like, people were saying, like, man, we're, we're behind you guys. It doesn't matter. Like, we, we love you guys. You, what you've done for the city has been amazing. Um, and, and that means a lot. I mean, a lot of times when teams, well, fan bases have lot, lots of wins or have won back-to-back or whatever, uh, they get spoiled and, like, just want to be on you all day. If you lose, they're like, oh, they're terrible. Oh, they're bad. They're not, like, they're not like the other team. But, no, our fan base was still there for us, still rooting us on. Uh, they believed in us. Well, thankfully, you guys have raised the bar high enough that there hasn't been many opportunities, even if people wanted to be naysayers. Just look at what's happening and look at the scoreboard each and every week, and it's pretty clear who the bosses of the Canadian Football League are right now. Hey, what uh, what's a sat a huge win in a rivalry game to go to twelve and one? What's Saturday night after the game for like for Jackson Jeffcoat? Do you go out with the fellas? Are you just hanging out on the couch with an ice pack? I mean, uh, what's uh, what was Saturday night like for you and the fellas after that big win? Uh, it wasn't super exciting. I think a couple guys went to Nicolino's uh, and they got some pizza whatnot. Some of us just hang out in the stadium for a little bit together. Um, I'm a little, I was a little boring. I have two puppies here at home. So I, uh, I came back, uh, ate a little bit of food, hung out with them. I don't even remember what else I did. I just relaxed. Uh, normal I'm suit. I'm too exhausted to do anything. Uh, but it was a, it was nice. It was relaxing. Uh, I'm not a big go out guy. I'm 31 years old now, so and been there, go. done that. <laughs> Just yeah, want to get ready for the that. next game. Well, you don't want a serious note. I mean, we spend so much time talking about what the practice. We know when you guys are out there, but for the couple days after a game, when you guys are off, I mean, are you back in the facility uh, getting treatment and whatnot, or is it just a great opportunity to, uh, and obviously you did have the fan appreciation day, so that was something that guys took part in, but more often than not, would you be horizontal doing what many fans are doing maybe the day after the game, and that's just resting and recuperating? Yeah, I think that's a big thing for me. Um I just like to relax. I like to get my body right because I want to be ready for the next week. I mean, this this is my job. 
So uh, and we don't get to play this game very long. So I want to make sure that I'm, I'm doing everything I can to, to be the best possible. Uh, I think uh, celebrating, partying, all that, I can do that when I'm done. Like, yeah, I celebrate a win, but I, uh, I try to do what's best for my body. Well, you mentioned the next one. The next one is Saturday afternoon in Hamilton, a place where I'm sure you've got some fond memories of, considering the uh, the last trip out there. But, um, but, but I mean, you've played this team in the last two Grey Cup matchups with everything on the line. Um, you know, you don't see the East teams as much, but is it uh, is it a little special, or does it bring you guys back to the some of the biggest games you've ever played going up against a Hamilton team that doesn't have the record that we're used to from the last two seasons. Mm -hmm. this, this Hamilton team is still good. They're still a good team. They just had some things go wrong with quarterback and just injuries. Uh, kind of like us having injuries. Um, so it, it's, uh, like I said, I like playing in Hamilton. They have a good atmosphere. they got great fans. They're loud. It's a fun place to play. Uh, and this team is physical, so it's a fun challenge for us to go against another physical team and hey, uh, continue playing the game we love. Jackson Jeffcoats with us from the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. Speaking of injuries, some great news on that front is uh, your guy B.A., Brandon Alexander, back practicing with the ones today. Um, how big of a part of the team is he and has he been even without playing so far this season? And how much will he bring to the lineup when he's able to uh, suit him up again with you guys? Um, he's BA is special. He's a special guy, special player, special friend to me. Uh, I'm excited to have him back. He's a leader back there in the secondary. Um, uh, we, uh, we desperately, desperately needed our, our, our center guy, our safety in the, in the back, just to be able to, to help out and discourage people from throwing it down the middle. Um, he's, a uh, he just he gets things done. I mean, he uh, he's gonna come out and play well. He'll do well. He's got a special energy level too. It seems. I mean, e even away. I mean, you see him in the middle of winter doing a, a a fan engagement thing. I mean, he comes with a special level of energy. I imagine that is never more apparent when you're outside in between the white lines. Oh, definitely, definitely. He does have a special energy. He's a special person. He's just uh, he's genuine. He's a real person. He you you anybody can talk to him. I don't know if he has a mean bone in his body. As much as people want to say, like, oh, he's trying to hit people like that. He did that. No, he just he just plays football the way it's meant to be played, and that's hard. Well, uh, that uh, goes for uh, pretty much everyone wearing that jersey right now. Saturday afternoon in Hamilton. Three o'clock start here in Winnipeg. We'll uh, all be watching here at home, and then looking forward to another game against Saskatchewan the following week here at home. Jackson, before we go... Um, Greg Ellingson was on with us, and we got to meet Zeus, his dog. Uh, Piper seems to me make appearances every time Mike McIntyre's there. Uh, mm -hmm. Are you are are the new members of the Jackson Jeffcoat household around? Would you like to show off the pups to uh, fans of the Blue and Gold? <laughs> they're not new members. I just call them puppies. They're not puppies, but they're. I don't know if you can even hear them. They've been playing around this whole time. Come here. Yeah, well, we knew that they were somewhat around in the uh, in the building. So give us a little introduction to uh, to Team Jeffcoat. This is Nala. She's the oldest. She's three years old. Uh, the funny thing about my dogs is that my mom's dogs had them. My mom's dog and my little sister's dog had puppies. So I got I got the puppies out of them. I'm normally a big dog guy, but I got little little dogs now. And the other one, T'Challa, come here. This is T'Challa. He doesn't normally stay still, but here he goes. Well, wow, so well behaved, jumping on the program today. Knew he was going to get a little camera time. Yeah, yeah, he's being good. <laughs> Nala's trying to get back up here. Come here, girl. Come on. Well, you can get get the whole team up here to finish up finish up our visit today. This is uh, <laughs> this is great. The people always goes nuts, and you know, listen, if you're listening on the podcast right now, <laughs> this is a good reason to pop into the YouTube so you can see. <laughs> The uh, two lovely little dogs of Jackson Jeffco. Those those Nala, two keep key... T'Challa. <laughs> uh, they keep you busy when uh, when you're away from the stadium. Oh, most definitely, most definitely. I was just uh, talking to my uh, I forgot who I was talking to, but I was saying I feel like a single dad with two two little kids and having to come home and and take care of them all the time. 
Well, I got to tell you, you've been taking care of your opponents pretty darn well, along with your teammates so far. 12-1. and one. Can't wait for the game on Saturday and can't wait to, wait to see what this team's capable of throughout the regular season and hopefully on a, another playoff run, ending the way the last two went. For sure. We got to get it done. We got to keep it going. We're not done yet. Jackson, all the best. Continued success, man. Be well, and thanks for doing this. We'll talk to you soon. Hey, my pleasure. Appreciate you. All right, man, that was fun. Jackson Jeffco is the best uh, on the field and honestly, one of the most eloquent, well-spoken athletes we've had on the show ever. So much fun. And I knew you all would love the dogs. I, Remus, is that the first double dog visit we've ever had on WST? Uh, it's possible. I'm trying to think if we've had a double dog before. I think John Rush, was he just one dog? I'm trying to think mm. of... Uh, of the dogs we've had, um, Ellingson had a dog. Well, Mike, Mike, I think may have had two at one point, Piper and the other one. Yeah. Ellingson just had big Zeus. Z big Zeus was as big as about three dogs. So I, I got, I've been meaning to do this. I got to make like a montage of all the dog visits we have. I know Ruwiki had his dog. I don't remember when, but there was a dog. Uh, and I yeah. think I'm like, sure there's some people that are listening right now will remember some dogs that we're forgetting over the mm -hmm. 300 and however many shows we've done. So in the comments uh, and in the chat, and if you're watching afterwards, yes, give some love in the comments to Marat, Jackson, and JT. Great guest today and a real great show. Uh, you know what dogs love too is ice cream. Like people, I know Nick and Dickie will often have little cones for the uh, for the dogs when they pop by one of the Nick and Nicky DQs. Uh, but for kids and adults alike, it is always blizzard time at Nick and Nicky DQ. Not to mention some amazing food items, including the stack burgers, amazing chicken fingers. Get the ones tossed in barbecue, my personal favorite, and so much more. Uh, pop by and support our great sponsors, Nick and Nicky DQ. Four locations, DQ Niverville, DQ Northgate, DQ Polo Park, and DQ St. Anne's. And you can also get at them on Instagram at DQ Manitoba if you want to get a custom cake order in from the comfort of your own home to pick up quick and easy at any of the four Nick and Nicky DQ locations. Always cheers in our friends at Little Brown Jug. And again, thanks to everyone that came out a couple weeks ago for our first ever Winnipeg Sports Talk Sports Trivia Night. What a blast that was and a great success filling the place. Uh, but if you haven't had a chance to pop by there on William Avenue, the new patio is absolutely gorgeous. And it looks like we're going to have, not particularly today, but going into next week, some abnormally warm weather for September. So still a great time to check it out while the sun is shining. In the meantime, you can get all the delicious Little Brown Jug beers and merchandise down at the brewery and tap room on William Avenue. And you can get the great taste of Little Brown Jug throughout the city at your favorite beer store. And you can also order online at littlebrownjug.ca. And uh, let's get to it. Big night at Assiniboia Downs coming up. Uh, I, had a, well, I had an okay night last night. We, we, we won on, uh, what, was, was it King Wit last night that we were on, Remo? It was one of the Wit horses that I always um, blindly bet because they're always good. We won on... Get Wit Gone, I want to say, and I'm checking now. Get Wit Gone was the Get winner. Get Wit Gone. West didn't pay a lot, it, but you know, it, he ended up being quite the favorite for the uh, for the event. Um, anyways, one more day of live racing left, and uh, t this week, five more on the calendar, so make sure to get out there next couple of weeks while you can. Uh, Remo, what are you dropping for today's live racing card at the Downs? Okay, I got to remember... My picks here. Hold on, I gotta br bring them up. I know who I took. I took my favorite horse. Uh, I've won with him before. Great name. Uh, sorry, I, it's it's really slow. I took really slow, obviously. Um, <laughs> and I took him to win, but I also took a uh, really slow King Wit Quinella to finish first, second in any order. Uh, that is on my on my card. Sorry, I don't have it in my list here. One took open. Yeah, so that's two $5 bets right there. Uh, trying to remember the other ones. Apologies. Race really number just, two. Race I really number dropped two. the ball here. I, I had on... all Jackson Jeff coding for you to get, get these up on the screen. <laughs> I messed up. 
Race um, number two, I'm on Mia Bear. That is uh, sort of a little chalkier favorite, but Mia Bear has been very good. Kim's mm. Texas Bling, I thought about it, but I think okay. Mia Bear is the pick That's in fine. race number two. That's funny. I have the Mia Bear, Kim's Texas Bling, Quinella. Seems kind of chalky, but uh, I'm into that one. And I also have race three to win. I am selecting... Oh, yeah, not a horse, but I'm I'm picking a snake to win. A Cuban Cobra. They're going to put this snake... In the gate, it's gonna snake sli- versus horse tonight yeah. at the Cinnaboy Downs. Go- it's I'm gonna here slither for it. all the way around Cuban, Cuban Cobra. I didn't know that you could put a a snake uh, racing. I actually thought it sounded more like a a wrestler, a professional wrestler, than a horse, Cuban Cobra. But uh, I'm taking that one. And there's one more pick I have as I pull it up. Uh, race four. I am taking horse one to win. And it is, oh no, really slow. Sorry, that's really slow. I don't know. I la- I, la- I have one more pick. I can't read my own damn pick. No, no, I said them all. I yeah. said Cuban Cobra, the Mia Bear, uh, Quinella, really slow and really slow King Wick Quinella. Those are my four picks. I'm my surprised bad. you didn't go in your other favorite horse, Trump Um, back in it today. Trump Nine Um to doesn't win. Favorite I, I know, it's funny. Trump, it, it's true. We There's... thought about it before. No, not anymore. Yeah. So I've got Mia Bear in race number two. In race number seven, uh, uh, of course, I'm going with wit nine, horse number four. And, uh, or sorry, no, in race seven, we've got Aniar, excuse me, Aniar, 12 to one. That is the one. I was thinking about wit nine, uh, but I do have two $1 triactor boxes. Race number four, we've got one, four, and six, which is really slow. King Wit and Mr. Pickles. <laughs> Those are great names. Uh, and then in race number six, a one four five triactor box, True Kate, Barbie's Quest, and Miami Souvenirs. Uh, if you can't make it out to the track, but you would like to sprinkle a little bit with us, get to hpibet.com. You can bet on Assiniboia Downs for live racing as well as tracks around the world. And, of course, you can watch it all at AS Downs' YouTube channel. Uh, and pay attention, some massive guaranteed payouts coming out before the end of the season. So, uh, nice opportunity to hit a big one. Let's get to the Cool Bet lines today for our friends at Cool Bet Canada. By the way, I was just doing some calculations. Normally, we do the Wednesday lock shop earlier. Dusty had a meeting, so the lock shop today is going to come up in about an hour and a half or so. Um, check my Twitter feed uh, and Dustin Nielsen's Twitter feed for it live, but make sure you're subscribed to the lock shop wherever you get in podcasts. Uh, my record against the spread for the CFL after an 0-3-1 week one I'm going to bury Horowitz myself for a minute, but it has been stellar. I have not had a losing week since week one. And my number, my total for the year ream against the spread now is 32, 22, and one. Yeah, that's that's Which really is pushing strong. 60%. So against the number, that is that is very good. If you want to see what we've got for the games this weekend, join us this afternoon in about 90 minutes. Um, and we've actually had a little bit of line movement since I put the picks in. And uh, I don't know, maybe we're moving some lines too. Right now, Saskatchewan is seven and a half point favorites against the Edmonton Elks. By the way, big uh, news in Saskatchewan. Congratulations to Cody Fajardo and his lovely wife, Laura, on the birth of uh, their, uh, I believe it was a son. I had a baby yesterday. Luca. It was kind of neat, vid- neat video. Luca, that's right. Neat video of Cody. Leaving the uh, leaving the practice field during practice and all of his uh, teammates hooting and hollering. So nice for the riders to have some good news after a lot of bad news on the field in these last couple of weeks against the Blue Bombers. And speaking of those Blue Bombers, they are seven and a half point favorites now. We're eight and a half point favorites in Hamilton against the Tiger Cats. Tiger Cats seven and a half point home dogs and plus two fifty five on the money line. As are the Elks on the road in Saskatchewan. Final game of the week is the BC Lions still reeling with the loss of Nathan Rourke. We'll find out whether it's Vernon Adams Jr. getting his first start for the Lions in Calgary against the Stamps. That's a big one in the West, though. Eight and three, eight and four. Calgary, those seven point favorites right now at Cool Bet. And no surprise, the Bombers are still the odds on betting favorite for the Grey Cup, plus 114 
right now. Um, NFL lines are up. Tomorrow's game, Chiefs Chargers was three and a half. It's now four for Kansas City. And the over under 54.5. Everyone expecting a lot of fireworks between those two offenses tomorrow. And uh, if you go to the Cool Bet specials, listen, this isn't a hot time for golf, but the Fortinet Championship is on. I won't be doing too much, maybe a DraftKings lineup, but I am in on my guy, Pat Gregoire's golf special. The Greggy Golf Special, Max Homa, the defending champion, Taylor Pendrith, Canadian, cool bet guy, playing on the President's Cup team next week, so he'll want to be in good form. And Sahithi Gala, all to finish in the top 20 in this tournament is 14 to 1. It looks like a great number. I'm in on it. Uh, if you do want to have a random golf bet for the weekend in this Fortinet championship. May I suggest the Greggy golf special in the cool bet specials. If you haven't played a cool bet before, use the promo code WST for a 100% bonus on your first deposit up to $200. Um, what a fun show today, Remo. Uh, I was so great. I mean, everyone knows how much I enjoy chatting it up with Marat. It was awesome to have him back on the program. Uh, great to get a little taste of what's going on down at the Iceplex with Jamie Thomas and the one and only Jackson Jeffcoat coming on the show with his dogs at the end of it, which was a big, big hit in the chat for folks that were able to watch it on video. Yeah, it was huge. A couple notes. Uh, Rick Campbell did say earlier this week that Vernon Adams Jr. will start. All right. Uh, the so we'll see. Vernon Adams but, Jr. time. The, and the other quarterback note in the CFL, Taylor Cornelius getting a two-year deal with the Elks. Um, so there, and there you go. Those, that's oh, the that's interesting. We're going to have to do a little digging at what's happened on the Hamilton side. Speaking they don't have of a quarterback. quarterbacks, speaking Who's of their quarterbacks quarterback? going into this game. They don't I'll have be one. honest, when I saw that eight and a half and just the way the Bombers have sort of, I mean, they've won these games out east, but I mean, the game in Ottawa was really close. The game in Toronto was really close. Um, I'm not sure the Bombers we were going to run away with that. However, if the Ticats get anything close to the quarterbacking that they had <laughs> in the last week against the Argos, um, that is going to be uh, is going to be ugly. Uh, I will say that um, only three games in the Canadian Football League this week, as we mentioned. But the lock shop on the CFL coming up a little later on this week. Um, we still got lots to come this week, everybody, uh, on the program. And thanks to everyone that's come out. Lots of new folks. We've had some big numbers, massive podcast downloads the last few days. So if you haven't already, make sure you're subscribed on the YouTube channel. And if you're watching on YouTube, make sure you subscribe on the podcast. Totally free, of course. And if you can tell a friend about WST, show them how to subscribe and join us daily. Certainly would love to do that. Um, we will talk some CFL, some NFL tomorrow with Mo Khan in Montreal. It's been a minute since we've had Mo on. Can't wait to have him on. He's one of my favorites. And Brandon Rewicki as well uh, with his thoughts on the Jets, prospect camp, upcoming training camp, and more. Tomorrow's Chiefs Chargers as well. We'll certainly hit that and a little bit more on the Winnipeg Jets as they skate tomorrow and then head out to Penticton later on in the afternoon. A busy Friday show. We'll get ready for Bombers Tie Cats with Ted Wyman. More on the Jets with Ken Weeb. An NFL notebook with Lee Hacksaw Hamilton. Um, awesome show today, gang. Thanks so much for being with us. Really appreciate Jackson Jeffcoat jumping on as well as Jamie Thomas and the return of Murata Tesh. That's going to do it for us today. We will see you tomorrow, 1 p.m. Central Time, right here on YouTube and in the afternoon a little later on in your podcast feed just in time for the drive home. Thanks for making WST part of your day. We'll see you tomorrow on Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Oh, my God. Oh! Shut it down. Thanks for tuning in to Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Make sure to subscribe on YouTube and your favorite podcast feed at winnipegsportstalk.com.